So we have a fairly modern plan, and it's a plan that we're in general pretty happy with, I would say. It's pretty relevant still, um, but they're currently revising plans in the Sierras. They'll move up to Northern California, revise their plans up there, then they'll come back to Southern California, and we'll be looking at revising this again, maybe 2025 or so. It's available on the Forest website or by contacting me. It, it's pretty widely available. Uh, it shouldn't be hard to find. Shared amongst the forest, SoCal forests. Uh, it, that's for fairly obvious reasons. We have similar drivers of what's going on in the national forest, similar landscapes. I mean, there, there's certainly differences. I mean, there's a lot more timber on uh, the Angeles and Verdue in particular. Los Padres has a lot more land, stretches much further north, um, in compliance with the plan. So they're, they're the really binding parts of the plan. They, it's important not to uh, get so caught up in the big picture that you forget about the rules. And then uh, as a, another thing, hopefully you'll keep these notes so that you remember if you were ever the one having to go through and find those rules, you don't forget about a few of them that are listed in part two. Because remember, part two only applies to each national forest. And each national forest has its own particular standards that may be different than the others. And those are in part two on pages 68 and 69. They're sleepers. If you notice when you were reading these sections, the pages are all over the place. The, the information is scattered throughout. It's not that easy to find the information, which is why we pulled out those excerpts for you so you didn't have to find it yourself. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how, how interesting and challenging that can be. So what does it say about fuels management? Uh, the goals, this was pointed out at the start, that we've got a goal of community protection, pretty uh, clear, pretty obvious goal that's important to these national forests, that limit loss of life and property from natural fire. Notice that, so I would say it's a modern plan in that it calls it natural fire, right? And by contrast with the 70s, we might have said, you know, keep that evil fire at bay uh, we're, we're saying fire is natural, but we do need to protect the communities in the area from it. Uh, the desired condition under this goal, of the, the desired condition of the national forest is treated vegetation. So that's important because desired condition is, says, the plan says this is what the forest should look like. The desired condition in where communities are at risk is for that vegetation to be treated. How does that work with the With everything expanding community-wise, I mean, how does that, because I know uh, some of the, like, the new stuff is, is that if you're expanding, then you are responsible for expanding that threat zone. So we, we are fortunate. We had some really smart people working on the plan, and one of the provisions of our plan is that anything built since 2005-06 does not, we cannot treat fuels in the national forest to uh, protect those structures. But the homeowners, are they allowed to push that, that perimeter up into the 300 foot perimeter around the structure? That depends. Um, so 300 foot, the distances matter, and I'll, I'll turn to Stephen. Um, 100 foot is a pretty much guaranteed. Um, as far as meeting county codes uh, for enforcement. So the 100 foot is kind of a, there's no question about. Getting up to the 300 feet, it is a question. And the question, the first question I would ask is the structure older than 2005 or was it built since then? Because if it was built since then, they should have known better. And that's basically what our plan implies is that, okay, we've got lots of structures within 100 feet of the national forest before 2005. We're going to have to deal with those into the future. But new construction, they should be accommodating that defensible space on their property when they build. Yeah, the only, I mean, it would just, it would obviously fall into fuel height, right? And all that. So if you're dealing with, you know, the height of a fuel that's, you know, whatever, and you're basing it on uh, three times, just on average, say, but three times the height of the fuel. You know, then would uh, would that be a way to uh, justify going to 300 feet? Or I'll I'll talk about 300 feet specifically for a project later in the presentation. Um, 
we've used 300 feet a lot on the Cleveland for fuel brake width. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that came to be and why, why we use that distance. Um, but speaking in terms of the plan, I'm talking more about uh, the defensible space around the structure. So if a homeowner came to the forest and said, we want to clear 300 feet out onto the forest, you know, from our structure, because it's closer to the forest than 300 feet, um, we would have to look at that hard. We'd have to look at whether that structure pre-exists this plan. And then we'd have to look at what the needs truly were. And that's where our own fire staff would have to well, get into where, that. I mean, that's what John was asking, is he's asking um, how we, I mean, and we, we've done that where we're trying to determine the safe separation distance, which is the concept that you're talking about. And there's some research on that. Remember how, I remember when we talked about this, where it's like, um, how wide does it need to be? That needs to be based upon a fire behavior metric, in this case, flame length, we have our standard rules of thumb that we use for safety zone sizes, but it doesn't directly yeah. apply. So this, I would struggle with this, and a lot of people struggle, and our plan doesn't provide enough guidance. I don't want well, to... Well, and so that, and that's part of why I'm dancing around the answer, is because to me the question you're asking isn't a plan level question. Yeah. It's a project level question. And I'm going to be talking at the start about the plan, I'm going to be talking towards the end about the projects. And it, the plan has, um, the plan doesn't get into that level of detail. I mean, you read the detail that's in the plan. It, did it provide you any very specific information about how to deal with that situation? Mm -hmm. No, uh, because that's going to have to be determined case by case as the cases come up. So the, well, I, I, yeah, <laughs> that's why I was struggling with the way to answer it because we wouldn't, we, anytime you're dealing with it at the plan level, it applies to every structure. We, you know, we recently had 85,000 structures mapped in the vicinity of the Cleveland. So those 85 structure, 85,000 structures are each going to have a different need. If we were to set some guidelines for those structures that apply to all 85,000 without taking an individual look at any of them. You have to limit yourself. Yeah, you'd, you'd hamper your ability to manage <coughs> appropriately. For each of the goals in the plan, we have questions. And I'll talk about this towards the end of the day. Um, have we reduced our high-risk wooey acres is the question that we ask to see. Are we, are we addressing this goal on the Cleveland? Um, and I'll talk about how we address that, how we measure that. Hey Jeff, <coughs> in development planning for communities, on communities that are going to be developed near Forest Service land, does the Forest Service get involved in that planning stage? We do. Um, we do to the extent that there could be impacts to the National Forest. Um, or effects of fire coming off the national forest. Yeah. So, or something like in this instance, we're talking about can all that be predetermined, and you know, before anything's even built. That's the best way for it to happen. And we, we certainly, uh, any development adjacent to the Cleveland, we provide comments to the county about the importance of enforcing county code. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Um, it's really, the, it's a county function to regulate the developments. Um, as long as they're enforcing their codes, we should be in pretty good shape. Um, I mean, there's good county code, and that's what we should be relying on, because uh, it's not our responsibility to manage those developments. Um, it's our responsibility to let them know about any concerns we have, like uh, there's a canyon next to that development, and so your fire behavior might be a different than it would be on a flatter area. Um, we would want to let them know are those distances that you ordinarily associate with those developments are not appropriate in this area um, because of potential fire behavior. So that's, that's our role in the planning process. So that's our first goal in the, in the plan. Of all of the purposes of the Southern California National Forest, this is number one, right? And then number two, or number 1.2, uh, restore forest health. So these are the first two goals of our plan both deal with, with fuels management. Uh, restoring forest health, managing the vegetation to maintain or reintroduce appropriate fire regimes. I assume by now you've had a good bit of discussion about appropriate fire regimes and what that might mean. Uh, condition class one we call it and we you know, can depart for it from it in either direction. And the desired condition clearly varies by vegetation type. 
And you read some language in the plan about for each vegetation type, what is that desired condition? What does it look like? So if you have a project, do you think it needs to meet both of these goals? Well, we've got seven goals in the plan. Do we have to meet all seven goals with every project? Yes. Heck no. No. You can have a project that only focuses on community protection. That's important. I think sometimes we trip ourselves up trying to meet both of these goals when that's not really what we're aiming to do. So if the purpose is community protection, focus on your goal. Don't, don't try to go down the road of restoring forest health if the purpose is really to protect the community. Now, in some cases, we will have projects. Um, and for us, it's mostly in the, in the forested systems where we're going to be doing both things with the project. Um, but don't get caught up thinking you need to meet all goals with every project. You can any, still think of questions. It. You can still keep it like in the back of your mind, right? Like you, you're concentrating on wooey, but if there's a side effect from that that benefits one of the other things, and that's a positive, right? So Absolutely. It's not only, you're know, only doing this, so don't even look at the others. You always want to have those in the back of your mind, and if it applies, then great. Yeah, well, and that gets to the what you're learning in this course is that the more you know about that's also happening on the national forest, the more you're thinking about the big picture, the more you, you might be aware that something you're doing might cause another unintended effect um, that you could prevent if you just did it differently. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure we don't come out confused that we need to be restoring forest health if we're, particularly if we're creating fuel breaks around homes, if we're treating around homes. Um, that is the primary purpose, and, and that's okay. Our plan says we should be doing that. So hopefully I'm not jumping too far ahead. Um, say you have a community protection fuel break, for instance, and you know the NEPA's already been signed and we're gonna protect, uh, like for instance, we got Westridge. It wraps right around uh, Idlewild um, Mountain community. And then, but there's rubber uh, bow habitat in there. Would the LMP, probably not, trump the NEPA or? No, it's, it's more the, the NEPA, falls at a level below the LMP. And I'll, I'll get into that. That's, that's what this presentation is about. So you're, you're leading this in the right direction. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions about these two goals? You've read about them now. I've presented them to you. These are pretty straightforward, right? Uh, we get into some sub-goals, uh, reducing the potential for stand replacing fire in the montane conifer. Um, so we don't really want to be losing our, our conifer stands to fire. Uh, retaining oak woodlands and savannas. This one is a challenge currently. Uh, a lot of oaks are dying across the land. I'll talk about that later too. And reducing excessively frequent fires in chaparral and a variety of age classes. Coastal sage scrub, uh, the California gnatcatcher habitat. Gabbro and serpentine soils where we have the cypresses and closed cone forests. Um, so were you all aware that these areas are burning too frequently, that that's SoCal's big problem in a lot of our landscapes is we're burning too frequently, not too infrequently? So it calls it out in the plan and it tells us where to focus on that, where, where we should be concerned about that. Um, now, it wasn't even as bad then as it is now because the plan came between 2003 and 2007, so for the Cleveland, we reburned a huge portion of the land between 2003 and 2007, so the problem only got worse after the plan. We're still recovering from the 2003 and 2007 fires for this excessively frequent fire problem. Um, and then the closed cone forest, if they, so it, if, let me talk about a couple of the specifics. I, you've, you'll have some of the bios presenting at some point, or no? Uh, the specialist? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the 28th. I'm just sending okay. out a reminder email today, actually. OK, then I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of detail here. The, just to say the coastal sage scrub, if, if it burns too frequently, it turns to grass, and we lose California gnatcatcher habitat, threatened species. So that's a big problem. Uh, the closed cone forests, if they don't burn, uh, or if they burn too frequently, they don't have a chance to set seed and they can wink out because of an inability to set seed. If they burn and then burn again before they have a chance to produce mature cones. Remember, it's that truncated fire regime. We've got the truncated fire regime. Yeah. Um, 
complicated it needs to be. Sorry, yeah. No problem. Yeah, 100 plus. I think is what you're saying. Well, remember, it's that shorter interval will has to burn. It can't burn for a good long chunk of time and then has to burn again. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have those tails on either side where it's okay. It doesn't have as much resiliency. Yeah, you'll get more information on these uh, topics from the, the biologist. But to, to have risen to the level of the plan being mentioned in the plan, clearly they're important, right? They're, they're mentioned in the big picture of the plan, the things we're dealing with. Now we get into the strategies and tactics. So this is part two. Um, so we've moved from the big picture to more how you implement the big picture. Uh, prevention, prevention of fire-induced type conversion. I'm just going to jump through these and then we can talk about them. Restoration of forest health, insect and disease management, direct community protection, fuel breaks, indirect community protection, and you want to cite these in your proposed action. So let's look at a couple of them. Do you have any of the printouts up here of, from the reading material, Stephen? Yeah, it should be right. Is that what this is? So let's look at one. Let's look at um, insect and disease management. See what it says. Why not? Part of the point of this is that you have to dive in and look at it to figure out how to use it. So let's see. Part two... Page 93. That's pretty simple. Did everybody find it? Mm -hmm. So protect the natural resource values at risk due to insect or disease loss. It levels outside the desired range of variability or where needed to improve habitat. We do that by thinning conifer stands to prevent water stress and damage by bark beetles. That is, that is the objective, right? Okay, so if I'm developing a project to manage insects and diseases, I take this sentence and I put it into what I'm doing. Because this is, what I, this is how we said we were going to approach this problem. Um, so it's good to find whatever of these are relevant to your project from your plan and cite them. The public's going to be looking to see that you did that later on. Did, you, know, you said back in 2005 that this is how you're going to deal with this, this issue. Is that what you're doing today? If you're not, you better be prepared to explain why you're not. Um, but better, as you start to think about your project, you might look at this part of the plan. If you're trying to restore forest health, let's look up above on that same page. Um, we're looking at reducing tree densities and fuel loading, re restoring species composition to uh, a mix comparable to forests of the same era, Increasing the relative abundance of large diameter shade intolerant conifer species. So they, there's some pretty specific stuff in here that's telling us what we're intending to do. Now, this is not binding stuff. This is what I was talking about with part three. Part three is where the rules are. This is part two. So it's, they're more like guides. They're, uh, they're strategies and tactics. You can depart from them as needed but you ought to be prepared to explain why you're departing from them. There's some pretty good ideas in here for what we should be doing. Maybe our thinking has shifted since that time, but probably not a whole lot. Any of these have given you any pause, Fillmore, that you've read in here? No, I probably have to have it in front of me to be reminded. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're pretty straightforward. They make sense. That's why we wrote them down. So I can follow along too. One thing I will say about this is this packet that you produced, I think for the first curriculum, I have it on my shelf. I have a version of this that I use all the time, so you can pull the same thing for your own course. Yeah, highlight things that make you know that you think you'll use a lot and, mm -hmm. and refer back to it. You should go grab that one that's already tabbed and stuff. Yeah, we for direct community protection, page one sixteen, we're looking at you know, we specify reduce the number of high and moderate risk acres by using both mechanical and uh, prescribed fire. Highest priority for areas with substantial drought. Well, that's just the whole forest. Hmm. And insect killed vegetation. 
promote the removal of tree mortality adjacent to structures. We've been doing a lot of that up on Laguna lately. Uh, here's here's uh, pertinent to what you were asking before about uh, the second bullet under direct community protection. When National Forest System land is managed for direct community protection, consider allowing residents to meet state fire law or county brush clearance ordinances on a combination of private and public lands within community defense zones. So it says you can do that, but again, there is a restriction about new, new construction since 2006. And herbicides called out as a tool here. So that's, that's something we can turn back to and say, no, we really intended to use herbicides for fuels management you know, back at that time, if anyone challenges that approach. And I think that's something that I feel like we almost sort of rediscovered in our language when we started looking at herbicide in our NEPA projects again a few years ago. Um, we hadn't been using herbicides in, until about 2013 or so. Yeah. We picked them back up because of maintenance costs of, of fuel breaks. And we had, we had foreseen that need in our plan, right? I'm going to scan through to see if there's anything else that jumps out at me. Let's look at page 118. Um, fuel brakes. Maintain the existing system of fuel brakes. Hmm. What is the existing system of fuel brakes? We, we did a huge analysis looking at our existing system, and we didn't really have much of a system. I mean, I, 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 would, I would say we had, a, we had a bunch of fuel brakes. <laughs> did we have a system that we were committed to maintaining? No. We've only recently been working on this. Um, it's, it's kind of funny sometimes when you read the language, you're like, boy, they were sure idealistic <laughs> in 2005, 2006. It's funny too because like you go through and, and over the years having to implement a lot of those projects and then you're just going like, well, what the hell is this connecting to? It's in the middle of nowhere. Good question. Please ask those questions. You know? <laughs> yeah. And a lot of it came down to like especially like we had one like Indian Vista and um, Allendale. They were supposed to come down and connect and create like just a, a break away from the highway. And they were never able to get approval from the oleologists to go down through the drainage because it was, uh, you know, obviously, you know, the 600 feet riparian area, and they didn't want to. Nothing could be touched in there. And they did the same thing to us on the Bonita Vista um, because of the keynote. Mm -hmm. And so they finally keynote checker spot butterfly. Yeah, and so they finally let us cut like a little 50 foot section. And the fire, mountain fire, came through and ripped right across it. And the thing that they found is that it's actually they've been getting more numbers because as the plants are growing back, yeah, you know, Kino likes fire, it's, likes it's easier disturbance. for them to get in there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, but they were like, oh, you can't touch, you can't do this. And well, so just to, just to be clear, it's it wouldn't be the ologist, it'd be the ranger that they wouldn't allow you to treat that area. I mean, the, yeah, but the, all the ologists paid a big. They they may be advising the ranger they, to take yeah, a particular they a big course. Role in that. But I'm going to be talking about that. Whose decision is it to implement a project? It's uh, ultimately the ranger. Yeah. The one that's taking on the responsibility of dealing with the repercussions of whatever. Exactly. Goes wrong. Yeah. So the ranger is the one that has to balance the ologist's concern against the fire management concern. That's his job, his or her job. So, but then doesn't that fall back onto, like we ended up losing, I think like three, three structures, four structures in there or something like that. And then would that kind of fall against the whole buoy concept of defending the community? Well, so, I mean, you can, we can second guess any firefighting effort. I don't know, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. But so, we, Absolutely, we should be protecting homes where we're able to without putting firefighters at risk, uh, without having severe consequences to resources. So it's all a balancing act. And again, that's what the line officer's job entails. So that's really, that's who should be making those decisions, not the ologist. 
uh, back to your point earlier, that last bullet on page 118 uh, says exactly what you said. Consider multiple resource values when maintaining and constructing fuel breaks in community defense zone, or community protection zones. So what I was saying before about teasing out those two goals is not at the expense of paying attention to the other values of the land, but just not feeling like you have to restore forest health where you're protecting communities. I'll talk about why that is in a minute. Uh, any questions about the stuff that I've shown on this slide? Any thoughts before I move on? Okay. Keep moving. Uh, so now the design criteria. So the design criteria, uh, that means for project design, what are the criteria we need to be including? Um, design criteria in the plan, they're called standards. And the standard you have to meet. Right? That, that's the definition of a standard. You have to meet a standard. Um, otherwise, you're not complying with the plan. So these are the binding ones. Um, that's where the fuel break guidance is. That's where um, we talk about how shaded fuel breaks can be, what, what shaded fuel breaks can look like. You just read that part of this. Um, I'm going to open it up so I'm looking at it as I talk. There's, we have a bunch of standards that are required that are more timber oriented that are required by all for all national forests so that they're, they almost don't even belong in our plan. But you quickly jump to S4, uh, design fuel breaks in forests to be open, no more than 40% crown closure. So for a shaded fuel break, we have to meet this standard. If, if we decide we want a different crown closure, we would actually have to amend the plan. We'd have to do a project level plan amendment. Um, not something that your forest supervisor generally wants to do. Uh, we set these standards for a reason. So these, again, are, are the most binding parts of our plan. Um, treating our stumps with fungicide, you see that's a standard in the plan too. It's something we all do, but this is why we do it, and we have to according to the plan. Uh, weed free seed, and then we get into all the uh, wooey defense zone information. So most of our standards are a sentence or two sentences, but that S7 is a huge paragraph. <laughs> the one about the, so this is page five in your handout, let's see, third from the last page where we spell out those distances, 50 feet in, that was, I, I said it wrong, 50 feet in grass, oh, that, that's what it is, De defense versus min width versus max width. Very specific widths of our defense zone. Right, so this has all been mapped out for all the Southern California National Forest. We know where these areas are um, for wooey defense and threat. And then it points us, where is that line? points us to Appendix K. I'm looking for it because I want you to understand how this stuff works. Um, Appendix K is, is showing as a guideline. Um, so the standards oftentimes, you want your standards to be short and easy to understand. Your guidelines is where you get into the background information. So the standard is really your limiting function. The guideline is, here's some more context for you. Um, but it, in particular, this guideline has a lot of information in it. This is, um, and, and it's some of the most challenging language. There's a lot of flexibility built in, but then there's a lot of guidance built in. So like, here's some distances, but if the terrain doesn't allow for it, you can exceed it. So it, in many ways, there's, there's too much language here for us to be able to grapple with oftentimes. It feels like we kind of wound ourselves around the axle by being overly specific in some of this stuff. Um, towards the end of Appendix K is where that insurance provision is. Um, page 83. For new developments, the Forest Service will not allow the use of national forest system lands for developers and homeowners to meet the ordinance. So that's the part I was talking about before where we've got a provision in our plan that doesn't allow that. So it's all in, that's all in part three. Let me see if I've gone out of order. 
Um, so one aspect that I, that I did jump over, and this is important, the defense zone trumps other LMP direction. So the LMP's got a lot of standards that apply to all of our projects, things doing to deal with riparian areas, threatened and endangered species. When you're in the defense zone, when you're right up against the homes, that's, that's the guidance you look to. You don't have to deal with some of the resource issues if you're that close to the homes. That's important, and that's unusual to have one standard that trumps all the rest. This is one that causes us no end of challenges, minimizing the potential for treatments to provide vehicle access. Obviously our fuels treatments are pretty easy to drive across once they're treated, and people do. And so we have to be careful about how we do the projects, or we have to be willing to fork out money for putting up barriers or other uh, ways to prevent people or patrol it all the time to keep people on the road. Sort of depends on what public you've got in an area, but the plan says that's we have to we have to deal with that when we do our fuels treatments. Uh, avoid coastal sage scrub except for wooey and fuel breaks, uh, because that coastal sage scrub plant community is so sensitive. Um, if if we're not doing wooey or fuel breaks, we really shouldn't be working in there at all. So this one you have to include all applicable ones in your proposed action. Now, how do you know if you're in coastal sage scrub? Walk the land. Walk the land. Absolutely. I encourage you to get to know. Uh, Talk to your oleologist. Yeah, exactly. That's why you have interdisciplinary specialists, because you've got direction in your plan that you have to consider these things. So they're helping you follow that direction in the plan. Um, they're the ones who are supposed to tell you where that coastal sage scrub is. Not that you shouldn't know how to tell the difference yourself. I mean, it actually, it's a different fuel type, I would say. Uh, different types of plants, less woody material, uh, usually lower growing. So a different outcome for a fire. Um, but you have to include anything that's applicable. So who tells you what's applicable is the specialist. Um, because it's not up to you to look through this long list of rules and figure out, oh man, does this one really apply to my project? Like, can't quite tell. It's well, yeah, because I mean, you're dealing. You got to deal with watershed. You got to deal with endangered species. You got to deal with um, archaeological sites, archaeological certainly. Animals. And then from there, you got. Well, you you left out scenery, right? weeds, uh, air quality. Yeah, it, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and all that. And it's hard to be familiar with all those things enough to know what all the rules are, right? Mm -hmm. Impossible, one might argue. So this this was a, uh, an interesting discovery that we had in the midst of one project and and defending a project, and it was an important one. So it wasn't included in your handouts because it's not part of the core direction for fuels work. It's it's sort of buried in the plan. And I'll give you a minute to read it. So where might this be important? Can you think of any communities where this would be useful? Any communities on your district <laughs> where we're doing it? If you think about communities surrounded by forest, um, when you think of the Wui defense, remember we've got these we've we've got these distances out from the homes like 100 feet. So if you draw a circle around each structure, you wind up with a whole bunch of bubbles. And if you treated all those bubbles, it would be absolutely useless when a fire came around, right? What are you gonna do with the bubble when you're trying to protect a bunch of homes? So this direction lets us disregard all of that complicated language about what Wooey defense and threat look like if we need to do a fuel break instead. It might be up against the homes, it's still a fuel break if it's a linear feature around the community. So we've used that in particular for Lake Marina and for Pine, Pine Valley, Valley, talking about why 
um, why we don't have to use the defense and threat zone guidance for those projects. But this is buried in the prospectus. The pr prospectus is a part of the plan it's talking about what we expect to do in the next five years, like uh, how much annual treatment we'll accomplish in the next five years. It's not where you'd expect to find helpful language about where you can use a fuel break. So with fuel breaks in particular, something I'll point out is that, did we find any specifications other than that shaded fuel break standard? What about a chaparral fuel break? What should it look like? Was there anything in here that talked about that? Yeah, it says chaparral minimum width and a wooly defense zone. No, that's wooly defense. I'm, I'm talking about fuel brakes. So let's think, uh, well, on the Cleveland, I always think of a Wonga Ridge, Palomar Divide. Out in the middle of nowhere, you got a fuel brake. What should it look like? Mosaic pattern? What's that? Are you talking about a mosaic pattern? No, mosaic was from our old plan. We don't even use that language anymore. And we used to treat chaparral in a mosaic pattern, pattern, but that was prior to 2005 and six. Grass. You can, you can forget that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's based, it's based upon um, height of the fuel slope. Um, so you can make those did, uh, But did you read that in here? I, I agree, that's what it should be based on. Yeah. What about in here? I, it's a trick question because there's really nothing in here about fuel brakes and how they should be designed, which is really curious that we go on for pages about what the WUI defense and threat zone should look like, and we say hardly anything about what fuel brakes should look like. And then we've got language that tells us we can use fuel brakes instead of the WUI defense and threat zone. Right? Yeah, because that would come into, like, like for us, it's Westridge, obviously, but um, Westridge goes along the homes, to keep fire out of the community, and that section is actually 600 feet wide, and some areas 700 feet wide, based on the slope and you know being able to carry over yeah. with winds coming out of the canyons and all that. And there's nothing in the plan that says that that's not permissible, right? There, there is no width restriction in the plan. You follow me? It's important. It, we got all wound around the axle with Wooly Defense and Threat and left fuel brakes wide open. So in our fuels management plan, it restricts us specifically to 120 feet. It doesn't matter what the topographical features are. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna, in some brake. situations, 120 feet is going to be pretty limiting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we, we have a lot of, because it's not spelled out, I'm not suggesting that really it's uh, anything goes for fuel brakes. We have a lot of interdisciplinary discussions about what's the appropriate width for a fuel brake, but it's not spelled out in the plan. It gets resolved at the project level, which is in some ways that's the way it should be working, rather than having everything spelled out at the plan. We should be looking at the local environment for the project, not spelling out restrictions for the whole forest. So when we have fire on the dish on the forest, and you're going to start using it to achieve some fuels objectives, like reopen a fuel break. Is that still kind of interdisciplinary? Like, do you still consider other people when you say, "Let's make this ridge seven with seven blades wide"? Yeah. So I'll I'll talk about project planning because that, that's where we're starting to go with this, and and, and pretty pretty much at the end. Yeah, I'm at the end of the the plan portion. I'll return. I'll keep talking about the plan throughout. Um, but we'll get more into projects <coughs> next. Can you take like five minutes, please? Sure. Well, it's about an hour. Yeah, five minutes sounds good. It's a lot of information I've thrown at you so far. Yeah, because with that project planning, you can incorporate, uh, I guess, protection or whatever, like fuel breaks, that sort of thing, incorporating it with the fire, and that way it limits costs in, incurred. Yeah, I mean we can at the project level we can do in, more than what we've done at the plan level. We can we, we can have more specific information. That's what the project level is for. As long as NEPA's and all that sort of stuff have been done in that area and yeah. can utilize them. Yeah, exactly. It should be included in the NEPA. That's the point of NEPA. I'll get into that next. Take a break. At least move around. <laughs> Stuff, huh? Yeah, yeah, I looked into that Morris Ranch community. Uh-huh. 
it, it falls onto National Park Service land. That's why it hasn't been touched. Morris Ranch. So you know how you go past our oh, station at 52? Yeah, yeah. Up to the park top? Park Service? Yeah. What, this Park Service? Yeah. I was what, like, what unit? It's... <laughs> I don't remember the unit. I was looking at the at the map outline, and it goes Forest Service, and then it hits the Girl Scout Ranch, or the uh, the Girl Scout camp, and then from there it becomes National Park in that whole bowl um, with. Uh, you mean Lion, BLM? Lion, no. National Park Service. Yeah, NPS. Well, that's weird. I and know. I was like. And I'm thinking the only thing I could think of is that maybe that's why the Girl Scout camp is there. But that doesn't seem right, man. Because it goes from there up into the PCT um, on the Cedar Spring Trail, yeah. and then the PCT ties into Forest Service land. But that whole bowl, I was like, that's kind of kind of weird. But it's like Forest Service. So I'm thinking somewhere along the lines, a long time ago maybe, that they did some sort of land swap. Yeah, it's possible. So, Sounds like a mapping area to me. I don't know. We have to figure it out. Because right. the other thing that was interesting too is that um, BLM just did a land swap. The NEPA was a way to try to get us out of this crisis <laughs> mode of dealing with these environmental problems. NEPA applies to all federal agency decisions. Only federal agency decisions, but all federal agency decisions. And it guides decisions where environmental values conflict with other values. Um, so I mentioned it was originally conceived with big projects in mind, like dams. But it, has, it applies to all decisions made on federal lands, from the dam to the mowing of the lawn. Right? So that's where, and I'll talk about how it differs between those levels. That's part of the point of today. So both NIFMA and NEPA require us to do a few things. They require us to consider the environmental effects of our actions. They require us to involve the public in this evaluation. And they require us to document the process. Do they require us to take a certain direction with our decisions? No. They're process laws. They tell us to follow a process to come to a decision. They don't tell us what the decision should be. Right? That's very important when you think about if you follow the process, you'll be OK. Because it's not the outcome that they're trying to uh, manage. It's the process itself. So as long as you follow the process, you're following the law. So we've got to talk about laws, regulations, and policies. Uh, laws are created by Congress. Uh, that's, that is the way it is. Um, who creates regulations? Any idea? Would that be like the, the states and the... There can be state regulations, but for the Forest Service, for a federal agency, who creates the reg regulations? It might surprise you. We do. The agency. Yeah, the agency does. And what they are is instructing the agency how we should implement these laws. So Congress passes the law, and then we have to figure out, oh boy, Congress passed the law, now we've got to make it happen. And how are we going to actually make it happen? Through regulations. Um, I brought a fiscal copy of the Code of Federal Regulations that applied to the parks, forests, and public property. So. These are the actual regulations. You see, it's not a very thick book that governs what Forest Service does. Every word matters in this book. So the, it's not the, the number of words. It's how you know, what the words are and what they tell you you have to do. Um, but all of the stuff I'm talking about today comes from these particular sections. We didn't give you these as pre-reading because it's all process language. It tells you nothing about fuels. It tells you everything about the process. But you can always look back at these. If you don't understand how this process is supposed to work, th this is the heart of the information. Then we have policies, which are more like recipes. That's how I, how I explain them. The Forest Service manuals and handbooks. We do have to comply with policy, but 
this, this, the way I'm presenting these are in order of power. Laws are the most powerful. Regulations are less powerful. Policies are even less powerful. You have to comply with them. But even your, your forest supervisor can add a policy. You can have policies that apply to, to just a region of the Forest Service. It doesn't have to apply to the whole nation. Um, we have one particular policy, the NEPA handbook, that really is a recipe. So if you ever have to write a NEPA document, get out the NEPA handbook and follow the instructions. It's, you're, you're cooking a pie. Use the right ingredients, bake it for the right amount of time, it'll, it'll come out great. And, uh, policy, I mean, you know, my policies, you know, change very often like I think it, the one way I look at that is in terms of the change hierarchy too yeah like a recipe you can throw something in different if it's not working out pretty easily as opposed to the law yeah getting a new law passed whew, tall bar right policies can be are much more flexible you can change them through time and we do our all of our manuals and handbooks get updated our regulations uh, regulations have more public process involved. So actually one way this has been playing out in the news lately, um, President Trump had, had said he was going to trim out all the regulations, right? He was gonna reduce all the regulations. It's one thing to say you're gonna do that. It's another thing to go through the public process and do it because it involves a whole process for removing regulations. It's not as simple as getting out the red pen and, and crossing out the regulation. And, so he, he, he started on that effort, but it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of process. So what is a NEPA document? There are three levels of analysis, and I've listed them in order of increasing complexity and duration. Categorical exclusion is the lowest level of complexity, the shortest, the easiest. Environmental assessment, EA, is the second level. Uh, mid-level and environmental impact statement EIS is the highest level um, so at Miramar you you use NEPA too you're okay so I don't have to talk about CEQA at all I hope okay good. <laughs> so California has its own uh, law CEQA California California Environmental Quality Act and sometimes if you're working off of national forest lands you'll hear about CEQA that gets really complicated I'm not going to get it into it today because there's subtle differences between the two laws that you have to deal with if you're working using state funds or you're working on private lands where the county has to abide by CEQA. Um, that can get complicated quickly, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Just know that it's out there. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So CEQA is like NEPA, but for the states. <coughs> yeah. I was actually just reading an article in uh, High Country News about how the Endangered Species Act is regulated differently on state lands versus public lands. Uh, this is good for plants, even though animals aren't. Um, so is California has CEQA, which is basically a large environmental analysis process. Are there other states that have a level that approximates NEPA? I don't know. I, I bet there are others that have something similar, but I don't know enough to be able to speak to that. But there's a lot of states that don't have anything, yeah. um, or very little. And that's a comparison. Note, right? Well, and it's also if you're if you're thinking that uh, well, for for some things, this thought that the trimming out the federal regulations will make a lot of changes here is a little unrealistic because we have a state that has insisted that it's going to keep standards high regardless if the federal standards drop. So um, it's not it's not going to make our lives a whole lot easier. I don't imagine. State. So with that, for instance, <laughs> this is just an example. So it's kind of the same as Fed OSHA and Cal OSHA, right? So when it comes to safety, look, we follow Fed OSHA on the base, but since we respond mutually to off base with the city, the Cal OSHA trumps our Fed OSHA when we're working with them. Yeah. There's more but, yeah, there's more restriction. Mm. So mm -hmm. the, the California one is obviously more stringent than the federal. Which is uncommon among the states. So most states so have California lower standards than the feds. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So that's a little tangent. Um, before I move on, I wanted to mention that I did on this previous slide, these uh, addresses, if you ever need the information, come back to this slide because that's where it all is. Can I ask, say you have a, you're working on a project and it's uh, 
it you know crosses two boundaries, like a state and federal boundary, and it's one project. How does that apply to that? You have to follow both regulations, or you yeah. pick one. If if it, there's a bunch of ifs involved. <laughs> uh, in terms of whether you have to actually prepare a sequel, we don't have any sequel authority, so we we would have to turn to a partner, and a partner may have to do sequel work to support that. So uh, would they do it for just their portion of the project? Yeah, exactly. Ideally, we try to. We've we've gone down different roads, but it, it's very complicated. It's very confusing. Um, it's not at all well laid out across all the state agencies how you comply with CEQA. So it's interesting. Okay, let me move on here and talk about the law that I am teaching about. Okay, so categorical exclusion. Um, let's start there. I mentioned the categorical exclusion is the easiest, it's the fastest, it's the cheapest, uh, it has the least timeline. Uh, least opportunity for hiccups. So why don't you just do a CAPEX for everything? Right? So categorical exclusion means that there are categories of actions that are relatively routine that don't have a lot of impact. If you're, if you're within one of those categories, the thing that you're doing falls within one of these categories that are here in this book, List it out very specifically what they are, then you can do a cat X with a caveat that I'll talk about. So, but the first step is are you doing something that falls into the category? So, we do have a categorical exclusion, and this is that's where you find it in that book that involves fuels work, timber stand, and/or wildlife habitat improvement activities that do not include the use of herbicides and do not require more than one mile of low standard road construction. Examples include thinning or brush control to improve growth or to reduce fire hazard, prescribed burning to reduce natural fuel buildup and imp improve plant vigor. Makes sense? So that was viewed as being a pretty routine activity. Uh, I mean, it's something you're doing to benefit the environment. Uh, it's not got a lot of road construction, it's not using herbicides, so it's not entering some of these uh, activity uh, types that might have more concern for environmental uh, issues. So we use this CE. This is the only CE that we use on the Cleveland for fuels work. Okay, And I'll give you a picture of what it looks like when you need to use that CE, in my view. So I was up here last week. This is an uh, Indian plantation on Tribuco. Um, unfortunately, this particular part of the stand wasn't included in the decision memo we did, the CADEX that we did. So I'm going to, uh, forgive me, CE, we also call them CADEX, categorical exclusion. Same thing. Decision memo, I'll talk about what that is, but that's part of the CADEX. So I, I'm using, I'm mincing terms, and I apologize for that. I'll try not to do that so much. But we, we have a signed decision document that says we can treat some of these plantations on the Tribuco District. These aren't natural forests. They're planted pines. Uh, we planted them 40, 50 years ago. Uh, never did anything with them since, and this is what they look like. You can see that it needs treatment. It's, it's in bad shape. The trees are dying, right? It doesn't look like a healthy system. This is where that category should be used. How about this? Does that look like the same situation? You can see there's a few trees over here. This is right at the top of that climb up to the Indian uh, this is North Main Divide Road here. It's been treated before. Yeah, it's been treated. It looks it looks like a chaparral fuel break, right? I mean, that's what I see. Does somebody see something different? <laughs> it's like for self improvement, right? <laughs> so somebody did see something different because they treated this area using that category that I mentioned before. So I I point this out because this is important and it can get us in trouble because here we have used a category that allows us to treat in the timber stand outside of the timber stand. Um, beyond that, this doesn't connect to anything in either direction on North Main Divide Road. It's sitting out there by itself. So what function does this serve? Okay. 
yeah, it's not tied into anything. We're never going to defend the plantation from fire. The whole point of treating in the plantation is so that it can burn over, not to protect it from fire. So, really, it doesn't accomplish anything. And it doesn't clearly fit in the category. So this is a, a problem that I'm trying to currently figure out. What we do about it next? What we do when we hear from the public about this, uh, saying, what project is it that just treated a bunch of chaparral on North Main Divide Road? And I'll say, oh, it was the Indian Munhall and Elsinore uh, or El Cariso Plantation Management CE. And I'll say, what? But that's not the plantation. And I'll say, um, let me put you through a <laughs> district <laughs> range here. No, I wouldn't do that. But you see the challenge. All of a sudden, we put ourselves outside of the category by treating out of the, the plantation. So does that fall into the uh, fuels division? Or the, like, what do you mean? The film wars issue? It, it's way? all of our issue. Yeah. We all get yeah. to own this, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk about this. You'll see an area, a similar area, tomorrow, and I'll talk about that in, the, in a little bit. And could that still be, I mean, even though you treated it like that, um, I mean, it looks like there's, there's some sort of growth in the middle of the... Right here. Yeah, the tree's there, but what's that to the right? Over in yeah. here? Those, those are shrubs. You know, this is, there's going to be some debate, I think, with this, because uh, from a fire behavior, I've been thinking about this, from a fire behavior perspective, and I don't want to see this as a picture, I want a picture. From a fire behavior perspective, if you want surface fire in that stand of trees, then you need to start with surface fire. So if you think of it in terms of ladder fuels, you need a separation from those trees. Otherwise, you're going to be having flame, large church chaparral flame directly impact the trees, and it's going to be much harder for that to drop out of the trees. I hear you there. We agree with that. So yeah. then it gets back to that same damn question earlier, which is how much distance do you need? How far out from the trees? Yeah. yeah, and Which, and unfortunately, we weren't specific in our NEPA about how far out from the trees we could go. Well, or once once you have that once you have that created, now would it be feasible to go in under the trees, remove the um, the ladder fuels, and now you have an area where you can pull them out and then pile burn them? We're trying to pile burn them in the trees because um, it would take too much way, effort to. Well, I was just saying because that way at least you eliminate that that ladder fuel, and then now you can come in with your natural process of fire and and put fire down without having to worry about it getting up into the canopy. Yeah, and killing the stand out, you know? So well, you could use it as a, as a, a treatment to help assist with the treatment of the stand. That's very creative. <laughs> <laughs> right, well exactly, and, so, and, and this is exactly what we'll have to do for this project is be very creative in describing why we did this, right? Instead of it being a really easy explanation, like uh, if you know if it were treated out to here, it would be a different matter, right? I mean, there you've clearly got ladder fuels that would lead into the trees. The way out here, it's, it just I mean, it begs the question. I'll talk about who ends up answering that question in the down the line part of it, but we'll we'll get there in a minute. But, but I'm going to get to the next one, which will illustrate the point. So we used to have another fuels category. This was it. Hazardous fuels reduction activities using prescribed fire not to exceed 4,500 acres. That's pretty big. Mechanical methods, crushing, piling, thinning, pruning, cutting, chipping, mulching, mowing, waffle house recipe, not to exceed 1,000 acres. Um, we lost it. 2008, why do we lose categories? Why, why would you think we might lose a category? We lost it to a court decision. I've said that. Why would the court decide that we shouldn't have this category anymore? Obviously abused. Yeah, because we abused it. We Somebody was pushing the limits of the category, and the court took a look at it and said, you know, Forest Service, we can't trust you to use this category anymore. You need to get rid of it. That's why it gives me concern when we start pushing on the boundaries. I don't think that this one is going to push on the boundaries so far that we lose the category, but I don't even want to get close to that point. I mean, there, there's, if there's no good reason to do so. 
Um, the the uh, Los Padres was recently sued for using that category for chaparral treatment. Um, they ended up settling on the case and they're able to treat some of it going forward. Um, so there is some active litigation in the recent past around the use of this category, category for chaparral treatment in Southern California. But, but then you can also come back on that with the aspect of um, the fire they just had, stating that, look, if we had done this prior to, then you wouldn't have had all this devastation, right? Well, but the, the point isn't that you, that you shouldn't do the project. The, the project may have tons of merit it's how you decided to do your environmental document around it. To do it into the CE, somebody's trying to save time and effort and money and avoid some of the challenges of the process. Okay, so we'll, let's move into the other levels that you've taken us there because that's where we generally work with our fields work is at the higher levels of analysis. Oh, um, I have to talk about this before I move on. So I mentioned that to use a CADEX, you've got to fall into that category. We just talked about that. But you also can't have impacts related to extraordinary circumstances. And uh, there's a list of extraordinary circumstances that kick you out of using uh, CADEX. Federally listed threatened or endangered species or designated critical habitat. Uh, species proposed for federal listing or proposed critical habitat or forest service sensitive species. If you're going to negatively impact these things, then you can't use a CADEX. Same thing for floodlands, wetlands, or municipal watersheds. And we've got a lot of municipal watersheds. You have to be negatively impacting them. It's not just that you're working in them, it's that you're negatively impacting them. Congressionally designated areas, wilderness, wilderness study areas, national recreation area, Mount Laguna has national recreation area. Inventory roadless areas or research natural areas, we've got some of those scattered around landscape. American Indians and Alaska Native religious or cultural sites. Got a few of those here and there, right? Same thing for arc sites. So you have to fit within the category and you can't have uh, substantial impacts on these extraordinary circumstances. So if you ever hear that term extraordinary circumstances, just think all that sensitive stuff can kick you out of using a, a CADEX, a CE. So even if you're working in a timber stand, uh, maybe it's the spotted owl in your timber stand that makes it so you can't use that CE. Uh, instead, you have to go to an EA. What is an ID team? So the interdisciplinary team gathers experts from multiple fields. And I'll show you some of those fields, wildlife biologist, botanist, archeologist, fire and fuel specialist, watershed specialist, recreation specialist, landscape architect, engineer. It can be more than these folks. Um, it can be less than these folks, depending on the project. But you're not the one that has to figure out if there are extraordinary circumstances and if you're going to affect them with your project. These people are supposed to, to help you figure out if you can use that CADEX. And they're gonna, it's, and again, it's the line officer that's deciding, yes, this fits within this category based on the input they get from all of these folks, right? Is it within the category? Are there extraordinary circumstances that prevent me from using the, the CADEX? Any questions about that? You'll hear from some of them directly in one of your next units, so I'm not gonna get into detail about what they do, but notice there's a fire and fuel specialist that's supposed to be providing information for this process. Who is the ID team leader? Yeah, you, the one with the bright idea. Often people think, you know, I've got a project and I'll hand it off to the ID team leader. Like, what ID team leader are you going to hand it to? <laughs> you're, the, you're the one with the bright idea. You get to lead it through the process, and that is a job. Uh, and not a small job to lead a team of specialists working towards a decision by the line officer. Um, it's a piece of work. So, what time we got? Yeah, let me continue then. With, introduce you to the old triangle. We'll spend a little bit of time here. Um, this is an old graphic, but I think it's a pretty helpful graphic. 
even if you're not in the Forest Service, everybody in the Forest Service who's been here for decades knows about the triangle. So one thing it helps with is common language. You have the left side of the triangle. People know what the left side is. If you talk about the left side, the right side, people usually more just talk about that being Nipah. And then I'll talk about the bottom today uh, towards the end. But you see the plan down here. So we started with the plan. We talked about what the plan said we could do on the Cleveland, what we should be focusing on, our goals, our strategies, our tactics, our rules. That's living down here outside the triangle. So this side shows plan to project. So we're taking the plan. We look at a particular location for a project. We look at the existing condition of that area and the desired conditions as specified by the plan. Therefore, what are the needs of the area, that difference between the desired and, desired and existing conditions? And then what are the possible activities that could meet that need? What could we do that would solve this problem that we've identified that started with the plan, right? The plan tells us there's a problem in this spot based on what we see currently happening. And then we've got some ideas about how we'd fix it, and we say, well, are those activities consistent with the plan? So that's why it's called plan to project. We're, we're looking at what the plan tells us about an area, about how we manage the forest in general. And so it's a frame of reference, because we all have our own minds, we all have our own experience to look at a piece of land and say, it needs something. You know, I, I showed you that forest stand that, to me, looked like it needed treatment. Well, then I take it back and I see what the plan says about it, cross-reference my perspective on it with what the plan says about it and I go through this left-sided process. Notice that there's public involvement shown here in the middle, pushing on all the sides of the, of the triangle. So the public can be involved in the left side. You, your left side might be a community member with a house that's near the National Forest who comes to you and says, I need to treat on the National Forest to protect my home. So they might start the process of the left side planning. Or it might be a project leader, it might be a, you know, battalion chief on, on the district. Um, so, but the public can be involved on the left side. They can, you can invite the public to be involved on the left side. And that's something that the Cleveland Forest Supervisor has done in recent years to try to head off controversy with fuels projects right at the start. Invite people out to look at the area to get a common understanding of what, why we're thinking we need to do something there, why, what they're concerned about, what the local uh, residents are concerned about, so that you start the process at least with some understanding. Often, instead, what, what has ha had happened before is we develop this idea and then we, we unveil it. You know, Here's our project. And then they get to throw stones at it, right? Instead, invite them out there, talk about it before you unveil a big project. Incorporate their ideas before you even make it public what you're thinking about doing uh, in, a, in a big way. So that it's, it's new and different. Um, most people don't do le left-sided field trips, but for our fuels projects in particular, I think it's been helpful. The right side is what you do when you've got a proposed action. So you've looked at all these possible activities that would meet this need on the landscape and now you've got a proposed action and this says scoping so that, that's what I meant by letting the public know about it scoping we are supposed to let anyone who might be interested in a project know about that project and provide comments we're thinking we want to do this on the landscape what do you what do you think usually it's not a full project description or, or it's not as, as extensive as it will be later in the development uh, but it should probably talk about what tools you're using, what area you want to treat. Um, maybe it might talk about maintenance interval. Uh, if you know some of your uh, resource protection measures at that time, you could let the public know that. We're thinking we'll avoid this area because of you know it's a riparian conservation area, for example. And then the public lets you know about anything that they are concerned about. Uh, maybe they're concerned about herbicides, so they let you know they're concerned about herbicides. You, you know you'll need to look at that in your environmental document. They let you know about um, a unique population of plants that you had not yet found. 
right? So the public may know things about your project sites that you don't know. That is not uncommon to find that the public knows something that the agency doesn't about the National Forest. And this is their chance to let you know about it. So once they've let you know about it, you start the analysis project. And that's really what this area is all about. You look at, and the, the public can also, in addition to talking about what they're concerned about, they might also say, I've got a different idea for how you should do that project. I think you should do it with only mechanical treatments. Uh, no herbicides, for example. Uh, so you say, huh, okay. Uh, could we could we do that? Well, maybe we could. Maybe we should analyze it. Maybe we should look at what it would look like if we did it that way, and compare the alternatives. Then we move into the effects, looking at what the effects would be of those alternatives. There, say there's three different ways to treat a piece of ground. We look at the different ways of treating that ground, uh, and what the effects would be on all of those resource specialty areas that I talked about before. NIFMA findings, it's where we look at how consistent we would be with our plan with the various alternatives. I'll talk about significance a little bit later and decisions. Um, but this gets us from a proposed action eventually to a decision, notification, and implementation. The project can happen right here at the bottom of the right side. And then the feedback at the bottom is that we're going to monitor what we're doing. We're going out there, we're treating, are we actually doing what we thought are we accomplishing what we intended? Are we meeting the goals and the plan through our project? We went through all this process. We sure should be, but what if we're not? What if it's not accomplishing the desired benefit? What if we need to change the plan because the plan is no longer relevant and the project shows us that? So that's what this bottom of the triangle is for. Any questions about that? I'll be returning to it, but um, in more specifics in some of the coming slides. Quick question, um, say you have your proposed action and you know what you want to do and then the public involvement there, you know, in a sense, maybe opposing your idea or not really trying to go the way you're trying to go. At what point, how does the decision get finalized? Do they have um, say so as far as how we finalize our, our NEPA? I'll talk about that, the public involvement piece and how it affects the decision. Uh, they, they, they have the ability to comment. They even have the ability to object. Uh, do they have the ability to change our decision? Well, it's sort of, that depends, right? I mean, it, it, it's complicated. I'll, I'll get into it. You'll see how they have attempted to change our decisions in the past here and, and how it's turned out with one project in particular. Um, should we do lunch now? It seems like probably a good time to stop here and do lunch. How long you guys need? Uh, 45 minutes being on? Yeah. Good. Alright, let's do what we normally do. Yeah. 45 if you're in here earlier, we'll start early. Good. That'll be 12 45. Yes. I'll get it. You want to go to the pills?
proposed action. You scope that with the public. So that's a 15 to 30 day period. It's optional how long it is. Your ranger would decide that. Um, who you have on that mailing list. It's, it's great if you can get the people who are affected by the project to actually comment. Um, unfortunately, we rarely hear from the local residents. If there's an HOA, that's great. You know, if you can get somebody who wants the project to actually submit something in writing saying, I like this idea, that would be really nice because often we only hear from people who are opposed to the project. So you can drum up uh, some comment letters from people who care about the project. That's, that's okay. Scoping helps you identify the issues, uh, what you should be focusing on with your analysis, and the alternatives. I've talked about alternatives already. That brings you to the analysis writing phase, where you actually prepare the EA based on what you heard in scoping and what you know about the project area. The analysis and writing leads you to a draft environmental assessment. So that's, you know, it's the full uh, EA, but it's in draft format. You put that out for comment. Um, there's, there's different ways to do this. This is the way we do it on the Cleveland. This is the way most people do it, is you put that out for a comment. Technically, you only need one comment period, but you can get in a lot of trouble if you do it in scoping and then never give people a chance to comment on draft EA. So are you, are you giving that to the public? Yeah. So, so you give them... The homeowners and stuff like that will get a copy of it? And you, we don't usually hand out copies. We put it on the web and we send them a link. So they can go look at it however they want to. We, sometimes we'll say there's a printed copy at the district office if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's, it's their chance to look at how you analyze their issues. Okay. So if you don't give them that chance, they have no recourse other than to object to the project. If, if they have a chance to comment, you have a chance to change your EA or respond to that comment. So again, it's, it's on every bit of involvement from internal and external folks, the earlier the better. If you get it on the left side, you deal with it then. The, the later in the process you deal with comments or concerns, the more difficult it becomes. So that's why it's like you don't, don't keep your project a secret. Get everyone involved early. Don't wait until the end and then have to deal with the repercussions of having it happen late in the planning process. That is a required, you do have to do one comment period of 30 days, have to have a legal notice printed in the paper. Uh, the paper is set in the regulations. It will be the UT San Diego for Southern Cleveland, the Riverside BE for Northern Cleveland, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to publish in, uh, a notice in the paper then you have a chance to respond to those comments. Your comments, you can adjust the EA. Uh, if somebody points out, you didn't consider this species, and that exists here. Oh, okay, well, we'll add that to the EA. Um, somebody is con concerned about your project, but it's kind of a strange thought. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You explain why it doesn't make sense. You explain you know, why that comment doesn't warrant a change in the EA. That leads you to an objection period. Uh, so you're issuing a final EA at this point. You've, you've cleaned up your draft EA, it's now a final EA, and you have a draft decision notice. So there's the EA that presents the alternatives and the effects of the alternatives, and the decision notice says, I pick alternative X. I, I pick this preferred alternative, we call it, and that's what I'm gonna implement. Um, but it's not signed yet. The ranger doesn't sign it. And it's got a signature block that will be signed, but it's not signed yet. We put the final EA and the draft decision notice out to the public again, and we say, here's your chance to object. You know, you've, you've commented it scoping, you've commented it during the comment period. You still don't like what the ranger wants to do. Here's your chance to object to that. And the objection goes to a higher level official. So if it's a district ranger level project, it goes to the forest supervisor. If it's a forest supervisor level project, it goes to the regional forester. So it's someone saying, I don't think that line officer thinks or knows what they're doing. I think they're not considering my comment adequately. I don't think they're considering all the effects of this action. Uh, will you please intervene, really? <clears throat> then we have a 45 to 70 day, 75 day timeline to resolve or respond to objections. Uh, that's when we get to a signed decision and you can start work. 
So you can see there's a few built-in time periods. You know, the, these time periods, pretty long time period, 90 days. Usually it's 90 days, but it could extend, especially if it's a regional forester objection process. Um, you've got 30 days for comment that's required. You've got 15 to 30 for scoping. But you know, it's the how much time it takes for the analysis and the analysis and the writing. That's really the the crux of how long it takes to do a project. An EA can take a year. Yeah, that might be a kind of a middle of the road EA. We have some that have taken a decade. We have some that have been done in several months. So it can be done quickly. It can take forever, depending on the ID team leader. Usually, that's who I would point to and say. If somebody's going to keep that project moving, it's going to be the ID team leader. It's not going to be the specialist. They, they don't have the oomph. I mean, it's not their project. They're just helping you analyze it. Uh, a ranger can make things happen, certainly. Um, it can help that ID team leader. But the ranger doesn't have time to nag, to, to make sure that if we hit a stumbling block, we get past it. Uh, that's what the ID team leader is for. So when we don't have an ID team leader, we got a problem. That project ain't going to move. Uh, any questions on this before I move on? I'll talk about some of this in more detail with a particular project. Now we get into projects themselves, a couple of example projects. Hopefully it'll make it all make sense. The first one you're going to be looking at tomorrow. Uh, so I imagine some of you are familiar with this area, but not all of you. Um, this is Lake Elsinore here in blue. Um, this is South Main Divide Road on the Tribuco Ranger District, extending from the Ortega Highway where it crosses from Riverside to Orange uh, south. And most of this is existing fuel break, except this stretch right in here. And the way that this project was developed is that there were a bunch of CAD Xs and EAs for fuels work in the past. There, on this piece of the project, I'm going to show you on the next slide is the second piece of the project. On this piece, there was the South Main Divide fuel break up here. There was the Hickson fuel break down here. And there was the Elsinore Peak never approved fuel break. So we had two pieces of a fuel break and a missing middle. Um, and rather than refresh this one, develop this one, and refresh this one, we bundled them all together into one project. Um, so it's treated from the Ortega Highway to about here, right here. Uh, it's an existing fuel break. Uh, it is, when we did the strategic fuel break assessment, it, it's the top ranked fuel break for this district in terms of accessibility, uh, usefulness in the event of a fire, as I recall. It wasn't the highest ranked one, like and and part of it it's pretty obvious you've got most of this is a very um, pronounced ridge with a steep escarpment down to Lake Elsinore so fire moving either direction this is your only spot to catch it and highly road accessible it's a great spot for a fuel break until you get to Elsinore Peak <laughs> because all of a sudden the escarpment isn't so uh, obvious meaning there's there's a whole range of ridge in here so and we've got a community right here Rancho Capistrano of homes with some treatment around the outside of it so the district project design initially was to take the fuel break, extend it up over Elsinore Peak, really follow the topography over the high point, and back down to the connect with the Hickson here, so what's shown in pink. Well, we put that out for scoping, and we heard from the public that that's very intact chaparral and not a good place to put a fuel break on Elsinore Peak. And there were internal folks who felt the same way about it. That this was, that you've got a road that you're not going to follow. Meanwhile, you're going to carve through some uh, unimpacted terrain with your fuel break. You've got a endangered species, the Munza's onion, that lives in this area. So all of a sudden, you've got to look at effects of the fuel break on the Munza's onion. 
And so there was a lot of concern about having a fuel break up and over Elsinore Peak. That, even though that had been what the district had wanted to do for years. Uh, considering that concern, and the, the multiple concerns, the lack of road accessibility, would you actually be able to get people up onto that fuel break uh, in time to make use of them? It's pretty steep terrain to work. It wouldn't be the easiest fuel break to maintain, et cetera. Uh, the district ranger decided, instead of running up along Elsinore Peak, to run the fuel break along South Main Divide Road and with a lesser width just roadside brushing, really, um, rather than a, a full fuel break. Now, the a couple of other pieces of this that are complicated. This is a chunk of state land in here that's shown in pink, and obviously there's private land in here. Initially, we had thought we'd include some private land in this EAA because we didn't want to have a fuel break with gaps in it, uh, for obvious reasons. They're not as effective if they're not uh, consistent. And we had recently done an EA in the Alpine area where we had included some private lands. As soon as you start inc including private lands in the EA so that you can provide federal funding to them, it starts to complicate the process. Uh, luckily, CAL FIRE volunteered to, to do this piece of both the analysis of it and the implementation of it. Uh, and the same for some private lands on the north side of the Ortega. So uh, CAL FIRE saved us from having to take on the burden of those private lands through this EA. So that's why you see there's shading for, the pink was the original proposal um, to do a little bit of roadside work in, in the state land, but run the fuel break up and over the peak. And you can see that it was narrowed to make what became the preferred alternative. So proposed action is what we tell the public we want to do at the start. Once we get to the draft EA and we make it available, we're talking about a preferred alternative. Now that I've considered these alternatives, this is the one that I, I prefer. It might not be the same as the proposed action. In this case, they're two different things. I think that's what I wanted to get at with this slide. I, it's, um, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about this area, thinking about this area. We've talked a lot about the width in, right in here, and when I was talking before about how fuel brakes don't have any specific limitations, in terms of width in the plan, we sure had a lot of discussion about how wide this one should be. Should it really be a quarter mile wide? You know, that's, that's pretty wide. Is it really needed here? And you can see the at least what the ranger selected is narrower than what was originally proposed. Does anybody have any thoughts on this planning decision space that we encountered versus taking up over Elsinore? We're going to look at this tomorrow. Sort of you out a little bit. I think, I think it's just smarter just because it's more accessible, so it's easier to maintain. You know, I mean, you, that's one of those fuel breaks that you run into where, you know, when you're going up and over the peak, it's like that's when we've been stuck doing Southridge, and it's like it starts down off the 243 and goes all the way to the mountain peak, and it's taken us like three years, four years to burn it and get it all the way up there, and then to turn around, now it's like you're almost to that point where you need to start over. And we still have all these other fuel projects to work on. So, you know, it's like you want to get something that you can utilize that gives your guys a chance, but at the same time, something that um, it, as soon as you finish, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, as soon as they finish, they start over again. And, you know, it doesn't. Who's to say when it's going to get used? One, but um, it's it's easier to, to get the guys through it. You know, it's easier for me to brush a road that already exists, where I don't have to worry about you know clearing everything, and to be able to uh, you know deal with my other projects at the same time. Um, cool. And that you bring up an important point, which maybe have any, have any of you guys have actually read the Cipher paper, that fuel breaks paper? Have you guys read that yet? What were some of the factors that you had learned about in that that were important for fuel brake placement? Maintaining, to maintaining them as well. Accessibility. Accessibility. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, being in a maintained state, definitely. Mm -hmm. right, we should talk to you. But accessibility seems to be like the lowest common denominator. So. And the other thing, too, with that was that, I forgot what I was, I want to say it was like the paper you had us read for the last one? Yeah, the Yeah, paper. yeah, where he was talking about, uh, uh, what was it? 
he was basically saying that um, with the with the fuel brakes, I mean, obviously, I mean, the amount of money that's put in versus you know what's spent um, nationally and, and everything, but it, it's more of just the the smarter aspect of it, like cost effectiveness. Yeah, versus you know. So how are you going to determine the cost effectiveness of it? You guys have an idea? Run, run some numbers. That's what <laughs> that's what we've done on Descanso District in particular. Is start looking at your actual cost for maintaining that fuel break over a five or ten year period, using a very a variety of treatment methods. Start, you know, plugging in the GS levels and <laughs> well, running I mean, numbers. Because now you're looking at also right when you're dealing with um, you know hiring crews to come out and, and deal with that. Like we had 17A was our project like two years ago. Cal Fire. Cal Fire, yeah, they wanted help. It was like 10 grand or something like that. Well, the thing about uh, the, the Cal Fire agreement, we don't pay them for project, we pay them per day so they can work on any fuel break or fuels project on our district. But I think the, the, the calculation came up to something like 10 grand to do, it was like 15 acres <coughs> up over yeah. this hill and, Nine. and what? Nine acres. Nine acres, and so it was interesting though because they were so far behind that we grabbed our own fuels group, which is cheaper and it was more efficient. And the guys went in and cut this huge piece out of it in two three days that took them two three months just to cut the back portion. So there's efficiencies there too. So I wouldn't say it's cheaper though for our force account to go up there though because for one we hardly ever get our force account out there and then we only pay them two hundred dollars a day for like a fifteen man crew so it kind of balances out. You're I, getting at the point which is that you have to look at it all and you could spend a whole day talking about the cost of maintaining fuel brakes. So that, I, that's not I appreciate the discussion but I want to keep us moving. No 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 that's fine. I was just yeah I, I was just you know trying to get through just in the aspect of, of making a point of, of you know, what, what ends up being cheaper in the long run if you're paying for crews to do it versus our own personnel doing it and then what's accessible and then you also have to calculate mileage on vehicles and all that other stuff. Yeah, there's all kinds of factors um, and some hidden stuff too, like in case somebody got hurt or whatever. But I just brought this up because I wanted to prep for the conversation tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about maintenance and all these issues. Well, it's, a, it's a classic clash between topography and infrastructure. I mean, you've got the road in one place, you've got the ridge in another place. So what do you do? Yeah, the only other thing would be is to just look at, sorry, but it's just to look at whether that road is like the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, mid, mid, you know, mid slope road. Place, it's yeah, somewhat yeah. mid slope. It's not in a great spot. Mm -hmm. That's why it doesn't have the full width. It's really to make sure people can continue to get through there, less to try to stop the fire there. I could look at it tomorrow and you guys can draw your own conclusions. I think it'll be worthy of conversation. Yeah. Or we might be able to stop a fire there. We had the Wildemar fire kind of slopped up against it. <laughs> so, without it been, having been treated. <laughs> yeah, Good question. It, Hopefully I don't get off topic and you might cover it later, but um you had mentioned when you proposed the uh, Elsinore Peak implementing that, um instead of revisiting the, the <coughs> fuel breaks on the side, if you will, um, you kind of incorporated everything into one. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've been able to get a straight answer, but when it comes to the NEPA, because it doesn't expire unless there's like a significant change, right? Correct. But then I hear, okay, well, the NEPA's old, and we can't do anything there because the NEPA's old. So, so it, there used to be a five-year standard for re-refreshing your NEPA. That standard does not apply at this point. The, the standard for whether you need to redo any NEPA is whether anything has changed from when you did it. The longer it's been since your NEPA was approved, the more likely it is something has changed. So it's, it, you know, if you have a new species that was listed in the area, if new homes were built in the area, if you've got um, anything that has come along the way that would really affect your analysis, and especially whether there would be any significant impacts from the project, that's when that's the trigger to, to look at your NEPA again. Yeah, because I know on our forest, I was just talking to Snow about this, was that um, 
our NEPAs have to be revisited every five years per Jody. Hmm. Yeah, then that's a forest supervisor decision. That's a policy. Yeah. Well, whether I don't know if she's written it down and well, signed it. But it's a policy, right? Yeah, it may be an like informal policy. The but malleability. It's like it's like Will saying that we'll do left side field trips for fuels projects. It's yeah. it's his intent. Um, yeah. Let me talk about the other side of the highway a little bit. Oh, actually, I want to mention one more thing because I'm not sure if I'll be out there with you guys tomorrow. Um, we ended up taking a field trip with any commenters that wanted to do a field trip. Not only did we do one before we started the project on the left side, we did an additional one after the comment period. Uh, and we did it to make sure that they knew we understood their comments and that they had seen firsthand why we were developing the project the way we did. And one of the arguments on the part of the Chaparral uh, Institute, California Chaparral Institute, they pointed out that the Falls Fire had started up in this area. I think I'm losing battery. Um, and had blown across South Main Divide down to Lake Elsinore. It basically ended down here. So they're saying, why are you going to keep maintaining a fuel break that didn't work a few years ago? Uh, that's what they said in their comments. So we took them out there, and the day that we went there, it, we, we wandered all along the fuel break to different spots, and uh, it wasn't really windy anywhere until we got to the spot where the fire crossed the fuel break, and the wind's just howling over <laughs> down to Lake Elsinore. People talk about the Elsinore effect, and it draws the, the winds down to it. And anybody standing there at that moment could be like, oh, that's why the fire crossed the fuel break. And the commenter was there with us, standing there, unable to disregard the wind, right? So all of a sudden, that field visit became really useful so that I don't think they'll question it. They'll say, oh, because that's just a bad spot when the wind's blowing. And maybe we could have stopped it. Maybe under different circumstances, we could have stopped it there. But it's, he also got to hear from people who were working the fire at that time, when it crossed, you hear that all firsthand. That goes a long way towards addressing some of the concerns that they have looking at it on paper. So I thought that was a very useful field trip, personally. How often did you do that? That was a first, yeah. The, the, where we had done a field trip before the objection period, really, um, to try to head off some objections, really. Was it because there was a lot? Um, it's because this is a very important project to the district and it has a lot of potential concern among folks who don't like it. Um, but we, as, as I pointed out, we did alter the decision not to treat that area of intact chaparral, or that, that's part of the preferred alternative. So there's, we'll, we'll see what happens in the eviction period. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But this is the rest of the project that you'll see. Um, so you'll see this one's not a linear shape so much. This one's more infrastructure protection. Uh, we've got a hot shot camp and a... Um, prison, well it used to be a prison facility, now it's to be a YCC facility in here. Um, we've got you know, campgrounds here, and then right here we've got a piece of ground I'll talk about that um, this was included in a CE before. Um, we, we were doing, it, the project was called Old Dominion, and we were protecting these campgrounds, we were doing some, you could argue it was wildlife habitat benefit work around oak trees, limbing up the oaks, uh, try to keep them from burning up in the event of a fire. But then we were maintaining this area of chaparral. We had just started doing so a few years back. And it was the same problem I talked about before with using a CE to treat the chaparral. If you talk to folks on the district about why they were treating this piece of ground, it's not for wildlife habitat benefit. It's because this is where a fire is going to move from El Carrizo down to Lake Elsinore. It's an obviously stri strategic spot to put in a fuels treatment, but it's not for wildlife habitat benefit. It's not for timber stand improvement. It's a great idea, but it shouldn't have been included in the CE. It should have been incorporated into the EA. So that's what we did with it. We bundled up this, and we, we're now including it with that fuel break on the south side um, so that we don't have to defend a questionable uh, categorization of that activity. Um, let's see, what else do I want to cover? Oh, here's the other pieces of private that CAL FIRE said they would take on. They've actually already treated their piece. They were pretty quick on it. 
Uh, we, we dropped this out because it was a little further from the infrastructure and not as needed. Um, so a few changes in here between proposed action and preferred alternative. Anything you want to call attention to here? What about the MDE6? Uh, what do we end up with? Is it just a roadside problem? Yeah, this is really weird terrain. Like there's not an obvious topographic that. position to put a fuel break in. So we've just got some roadside brushing, so at least you'd be able to evacuate and or get engines through. Because I was really wanting to see that being connected. But if you guys ever drive on that, just really high banks on the side of it, which would be very difficult to you know, like just said. But yeah, we really scratched our heads yeah. over these shapes. And so I think we're, we're comfortable with what we're moving forward with. Is it a perfect situation? No, because it's not. It's never perfect, you know. It's never. There's only so much you can do. Your question, um, kind of touching on what John brought up earlier about, um, you know, our fuel breaks. I guess the reason I bring it up because we have some of our, uh, of our fuel breaks that tie into Cal Fires as well. And then, you know, when you do the uh, five-year plan and program of work, you got to obviously have the capacity to go back and maintain these fuel breaks. But if you're in a situation where it's like four service fuel breaks and cooperator agency uh, fuel breaks at that point is that going to play a factor in you prioritizing your program of work whether or not they treat as, as or like you or even us well yeah i think if we've you know we've let cal fire know we're going to be working on this i'm sure if we don't ever treat it we'll hear from them if they've done their piece we've dealt with that with the tribal project before down um, the descanso where we we arranged with the tribe to do a project together and they did their piece and we never did our piece. We finally caught up on that in the last couple of years. So yeah, if, you, if you're if you in that sort of an arrangement, um, yeah, it's probably good to honor that. Well, and then, you know, kind of conflicting stories I hear again, budget's not an issue, budget is an issue, and obviously the Forest Service runs into a lot of budget, budget issues. Um, what do we do then? <laughs> We stop treating the less useful fuel breaks. <laughs> Focus our efforts where we have infrastructure and where we've got a nice ridge and a road along that ridge and not the random, uh, well, I shouldn't say random, not the less useful fuel treatments that strategic. we've been doing. And figure out ways to cut costs. You know, the herbicide, we looked at grazing for a while. I think we've kind of given up on grazing goats on our, on our fuel breaks. Didn't work out as well as we thought it would. Um, so, yeah. That, that's not it's not as much of a NEPA issue. It's definitely an issue. That's that's about little NEPA primer for tomorrow. But let me talk about a, a project. What, what I haven't done thus far is given you much information about what people are concerned about with fuels treatments on the National Forest, and now you'll hear more about that in particular. So you know. So Mount Laguna and Pine Valley Community Protection and Healthy Forest Restoration Project. Um, purpose and need, I, I've, I haven't specifically talked about this yet, but I've talked about we need a problem statement for an EA. We need a general statement of the solution. What's the, what's the purpose? So what's the problem? What's the solution? And that solution should be broad enough that more than one approach could achieve it. So we could have a couple of alternatives that could all achieve that purpose without being the same thing. Again, if you can't identify them, there's no need for a project. If you don't have a problem, don't try to solve it. Decision, we identify a responsible official. I, I, I don't want to get into detail on this stuff right now, but I've already mentioned that for our EAs, district ranger is usually the responsible official. Well, I've talked about the LMP direction that we, that was what we looked at this morning, cite these in your proposed action. This is where you list those parts of the plan, those parts of the handouts that apply to your project. We have a public involvement section of our documents that talks about the schedule of proposed actions. The SOPA lists every Forest Service project. And so the public can always go there and see what we're thinking about doing. If we had any meetings, what notices we sent out, how, how many public participated in our, in our EA development. But now we'll talk about the issues. So these are issues brought up by the public about this particular project on the Descanso District. What are the costs and benefits, including resource and financial, on various treatment options, including location design of treatment units? All right, the public wants to know, what's the cost effectiveness of this work you're planning on doing, and how will it affect resources? 
What are the potential effects from chaparral treatment in the Wuyi Defense and Threat Zones, including potential effects for multiple treatments, like expansion of invasive weeds, type conversion, species diversity reduction, wildlife corridors, fragmentation, watershed conditions, visuals? That's a pretty sophisticated question, right? That's somebody who knows what they're talking about. And what are the effects of repeated fuels treatment on all these things? And, you know, am I ready to answer that? No, that's what my specialist will do, right? That's why you have specialists, is to help you address a question like this from the public. We, and we get some random questions from the public. And sometimes they make a lot of sense like this, sometimes they don't make as much sense. Uh, I prefer when they're organized, at least, like these are. What are the effects to global warming from this project? And what are the smoke impacts caused from implement, implementing the project? Ooh, yeah, that's a big <laughs> egg to crack. <laughs> what are the potential effects to special status species? Will burning outside the normal fire season affect recovery and regrowth of plant and animal species? Probably. Key issue, and they identified this as their key issue. Within the chaparral ecosystem, can the project be modified to treat the minimal amount of landscape needed to still meet the needs for the project? Reduce the risk of life and property and improve effectiveness of fire suppression operations and fire, fire safety. So they've told us these are our concerns. They told us this at the start of the project. If we don't answer these questions, then we've missed the boat. So they, that's the nature of this agency public relationship is we give them a chance to comment and then we address their comments. So the fact that we found out what their issues were and then we had a chance to respond, that's how it's supposed to work. So there were some alternatives. Uh, I've talked about alternatives. The proposed action has to be specific enough that the ID team, the interdisciplinary team, can analyze what you're proposing to do. It includes those LMP standards that we looked at before, the, the rules, but it can go beyond them. The specialist can say, well, there's also a limited operating period needed for migratory birds. That it's not in the plan, but it's required by another law. And any additional alternatives, I've, I've talked about that, how you can come up with alternatives. Sometimes they come from internal sources, sometimes from external sources. Okay, so let's look at another shape. So this was the proposed action for this project. So this is all montane conifer, basically up on Mount Laguna. And then this is all chaparral around Pine Valley. And you can see that we, you just based on the shapes, we've got, you know, we're treating the whole landscape up here. It's forest health and community protection. There's homes up on Mount Laguna. Um, there's, and we have infrastructure on Mount Laguna, but there's, it's also for forest health. Down here, there's no forest health argument to be made. We're, this is for community protection of Pine Valley, so we can defend that community, right? So this is what we proposed, and the, this proposal came out of, I'll, I'll mention the mosaic word again. That's where that proposal came from around Pine Valley. Was we want a mosaic of age classes surrounding the community of Pine Valley and the chaparral to make it easier to defend in the wildfire. So now that that's not part of the new LMP, if it's still in our NEPA, we still got to abide by it? This was the proposed action. So well, the reason I ask is it's in our project. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it's just stuck in the old, or it's probably an old one. Yeah, and I, and I don't know. I'd have to look at the project to know uh, why. Although most of our EAs came since 2008 because we were doing them as CAT Xs before. So this is the uh, modified treatments in Pine Valley area. This is what in, in the end got approved. And these are 300 foot strips around the community in places where we have the right ownership configuration and where there was no treatment occurring on private lands. So you can see a much smaller footprint. I'll, I'll go back. That, that was the original footprint, and this was the latter footprint. Um, so to have strips of treated vegetation around the community where we had the ability to, to put those in. So I'll talk about how that came in just a minute. Um, I haven't talked much about this, but with the environmental consequences part of the EA, each specialist evaluates the impacts of each alternative on their resource area. So your wildlife biologist looks at the no action, looks at the proposed action, looks at alternative two through five, and looks at the effects of each one. 
then your watershed person does the same thing. Then, right? So that's why that EA grows and grows. The more alternatives you have, the more analysis has to be done about the effects of the different alternatives. These are the typical ones for a fuels project. We have to look at cumulative effects. So for your projects, what that means is if, um, if there's been a lot of housing development in the area, that's also had an effect on the species in the area. So you can't consider your project in isolation from all the other things happening in that vicinity. Reasonably foreseeable things that are being planned included. So it's cumulative effects is a more challenging part of the analysis and it's really up to your specialist to figure out what else in this area is affecting my resource and how will this play into that so that we wind up with significant effects. Uh, which hasn't happened on any of our fuels projects where it's, it's up the level of analysis needed, but it could happen if you're in a sensitive enough area. Um, I mentioned this a couple of times, specialists identify those design features that are needed to protect their resource area. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about significance. Um, significance is hard to determine. It's, this is how it's laid out in the regulation. But whether we have significant impacts depends upon context and intensity. Uh, if it affects public health and safety, that can drive a project to a significant level. If there are unique geographics, geographic characteristics, that could drive uh, a finding of significance. P potential for environmental controversy. This one gets misinterpreted all the time. This isn't, is the project controversial? This is, is there scientific controversy about the effects of the project? Like we don't really understand what the effects are or there's disagreement about what the effects would be. Will this project negatively affect Spotted Owl or will it not? And there's two published papers that, that disagree. That's what environmental controversy means, not are people concerned about this project. Same uncertainty about effects or unique risks. You don't know what's going to happen when you do the project. If it's precedent setting uh, for future actions, the cumulative impacts I just mentioned, Adverse effects on historic or cultural resources. Um, this, would, this would be of a higher level than um, maybe your sort of ordinary avoidance measures around historic sites. Or if you, weren't, if you weren't avoiding arc sites, then that could drive it to a level of significance. Same thing for listed species uh, or any violation of other environmental laws. So these would potentially cause you to have to do an EIS instead of an EA. These, these would drive it to the next higher level. We talked about what drove a project from a CE to an EA. If you couldn't fit in that category or there were extraordinary circumstances, that drives you to the EA. The, the only point of an EA is to determine whether you have any significant impacts, whether you're likely to have any significant impacts. If you are, you've got to do an EIS. If you're not, your EA is fine. Any question about that? My understanding of NEPA was that an EIS was always the default document. Right. And that you, so the way you're describing it is that you start as a CE and if it's more complicated, so there's an EIA. That's, that's the practical works. approach, how we, how we typically do planning in the Forest Service is we try to do a CADEX if we can. Yeah. Um, then we look at an EA, then we look at an EIS. But I'll talk later about the EIS in many ways can be the preferable option if you know, you, especially if you know you're going to have to go there eventually. Yeah. The EIS is what NEPA was written for. Yeah. yeah. And in the EIS, what it boils down to, you can have significant impacts. You just have to disclose them. The EIS is a way of disclosing, yes, we're going to affect this precious resource. It's not, it's not forbidden to have significant impacts. You just have to go through the process. OK. Um, so we've got the analysis document, which is the EA or EIS. We've got the decision document that presents the rationale. Why am I, district ranger, choosing this alternative? Uh, what am I thinking about as I make that decision? What other laws am I finding that I've complied with with this action? Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, National Historic Preservation Act, etc. Clean Air Act. 
So our decision documents, it depends on the level of analysis. There's, we, with our CEs, the simplest CE is a letter to the file. That would be putting a new fence around San Juan Station, something we're about to do. Uh, it's kind of a basic admin type activity, but you don't really want to put the fence post in an arc site. So you at least got to take a look at it to make sure you're not doing that. You sign a letter to the file, it's a pretty quick process. Decision memo, and the regulations spell out which one is which. Decision memo is where that um, timber stand improvement category lives. You have to prepare a decision memo that the ranger signs to approve the project. And it's the finding that the activity falls within a category and no extraordinary circumstances exist. The EA's decision document is a decision notice and finding of no significant impact. So here the ranger is saying this project will not have a significant impact on the environment based on what I just presented to you. And for the EIS, it's a record of decision where they could actually say there will, there will be significant impacts on these two resource areas and no significant impacts on these five, for example. Okay, so we we sort of stumbled through the objection process for this project because it was the first time we had done the objection process. And it was a really good learning exercise. And I'll talk about some of the problems we had with it. We didn't release our draft EA for this project to the public, so they had never seen our analysis until it became time for the objections. We released our final EA and a draft decision as an objection opportunity, as we were supposed to do. But the district ranger thought that it was their job to deal with the objections. Didn't realize it was the forest supervisor's job to deal with the objections. So arranged a meeting and met with the objectors. <laughs> so not the way the process was supposed to have worked. And then, since he heard what they were concerned about, he decided to change his decision and pick that, those strips around Pine Valley. Um, so he, made, he changed his, his decision. He accommodated their concerns by choosing those little strips instead of the big landscape treatments. And then three of them, so then he had to republish that decision, and three of them objected again. <laughs> so same people had just met in a room with him and altered his decision and then objected again to the project. And here's, I'll talk through their objections, because it gives you a really good sense of what you can expect um, when your project gets to this tail end if people are, people are concerned about it. California Chaparral Institute, Native Plant Society, and Endangered Habitats League were the three objectors in this case. So first uh, issue that they brought up in their objections, this project is inconsistent with the forest plan. Uh, that we violated NEPA, the preparation of an EIS is required. And we should limit our fuels treatments to within 100 feet of structures, the defense zone uh, argument. So these are their primary issues. I'll, I'll break them down um, from here. Start with the NIFMA. So they claimed overly aggressive chaparral treatments, cutting of large matri mature trees and snags, misuse of the threat zone designation, that language we saw in the planning document, mastication in a backcountry non-motorized land use zone, that the ugliness of the project would violate the scenic integrity objectives listed in the plan, so we responded to that by saying your concerns were addressed in these places in the document or you misinterpreted the LMP direction. So we disagreed with what they said in terms of that these things were not consistent with our plan. And we have to explain ourselves why, why we think that. This was a, an analysis done by Fillmore and me. Um, so the district had made the decision, had done all the work, and then it came to us to review what they had done. And so we, we look at each of these and we say, well, but on page 22 it says that uh, we're only taking such and such snags per acre and that's within the constraints of the plan, et cetera. So it becomes very much of a detailed response to what they're bringing up. But we're going right back to the plan. Why is it important to know, be familiar with the plan? Because they are. They're familiar with the plan. They know exactly where to look, uh, where to find out if we've slipped and forgotten about a particular aspect of the plan. NEPA is, it's almost always the same NEPA allegations uh, for any project in pretty much any agency. Significant adverse impacts to the environment, significant effects to public safety, significant effects to geographical characteristics, highly controversial, cumulatively significant impacts, 
required to make a draft EA available for comment. Um, so they're saying we, we didn't follow the process right. And we said, well, okay, well, we had made some process mistakes on this one, so we fixed those. We shored up the finding of no significant impact. We talked about why the findings were reasonable because of what we found in the EA. And then we deal with the last one. The last one's not so much a, they're not alleging that we violated a law. They're saying we should be limiting our fuels treatments to within 100 feet of structures. And they cite Cohen's research. Have you talked about Cohen's research in here? Is that familiar? You already talked this morning. The, they were assigned to Cohen for next week, or okay. for next session. Yeah, and so Fillmore in particular had to draft a response to that Cohen wasn't directly applicable to this situation. How are we doing for time? Uh, it's 143, you're approaching break time. Okay. A little time. Um, I don't have that much further to go. Uh, should we break now or power through? That's it. Were you guys power want to take through. a quick five minute? Sure. Take any less sure. or take a break. <laughs> Stop midstream. We still, we've still got 12 more slides. Yeah, now would be a good place to stop. Yeah, let's finish All right, yeah. Let's take five. Oh, hey, Fillmore. Okay. So what I was trying to get at, which it eluded me for a second, was that <laughs> they said that 50, I had a dream. I had a 50 dream. 50% 50 of fuel breaks, they're getting the outputs that they want, Yeah. and they're not, you know, there's that, that, those variables make a huge difference. You know, and, and release and with, you know, everything else and, you know, fire behavior and, I mean, those those variables, like when they're running, you know, um, the, the, the sim going through, it's like when we're on fires and they go, oh, we're basing it on, you know, the sim says so many change an hour, blah, 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 but you get out on an incident and they didn't add in certain variables and then, you know, it can change that whole of what we're actually seeing on the ground versus what we're getting. And when they're doing a research paper and they're trying, you know, it's like they do it to kind of manipulate to what they want for the paper. Oh, that's such a cynical, cynical take <laughs> Please, on Please, come on. It's so true. Well, okay, so that's a very important take, though, is like, and that is actually... And a lot of times... Hold on, let me make my point. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm asking you guys to read these research papers is for you to make what's called, or is to learn how to do, if you didn't know already, the critical thinking skills, which is you know, what you're saying, which is, well, what are the, okay, these are the factors they're saying, but what are these factors, are these reasonable factors, are these the factors that I would put into it? Like, like, uh, Cyrus was saying, like, um, you know, is it fair, is it, does it take into account the variables? So these are good points that you're making, and yes, some people might make inscrutable, uh, might include variables that maybe aren't the most, right, relevant to the issue. The, that's up to you to decide. Um, but we do, I feel like we do run across this, and this speaks to like this Cohen paper like Jeff had talked about, like literally right up there where they'll cite papers and they'll just glean aspects of it but maybe not look at it holistically, right? So yes, people do that, yeah. But not always. Pure science, you know, real pure science. I don't know, the stuff you keep handing me, I keep going like... Oh, Why do you think I handed it to you, man? <laughs> you know, because they sit there and it's like... They go through and it, it's like, well, we didn't have these variables because they fluctuate too much, and we, so we couldn't figure out exactly what we wanted from these variables in order to input into it. So we just uh, excluded them from the, you know, and you're going, well, how do you get a proper, a, a, you know, fixed output? Yeah. You don't. You're modifying it. Perfect. All right. That's 20 points. You're getting it. <laughs> so real quick, isn't the point of a scholarly journal what can be scrutinized by like uh, subject matter uh, subject matter experts so that we don't get false information? Mm. I mean, if it gets published, it's well, even published. that can be a little dicey. It's called peer review, peer review. and uh, not all journals are peer reviewed. Remember, I talked about this earlier, where you need to find a peer reviewed journal. That means that there were people that were peers of the authors that reviewed it to check, and it's all anonymous, so they can call bullshit if bullshit is warranted. But even that can be a little dicey sometimes, depending on who the reviewer is and their own agendas. And one thing, I don't know if you would agree with this, Jeff, but there are researchers out there that, even though they're supposed to be scientists in a very pure fashion, still have their agendas, still have their biases and that sort of thing. It's like the House and the Senate. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> Aren't they supposed to be working we for us? We just politics. That's 50. Damn. <laughs> so let me let me jump in right where you're where you're heading with this. So 
I wouldn't say Cohen's paper is not valid. I would say it was completely it's how it's interpreted. Different. Uh, it, it was the the paper's findings don't affect the project the way the commenters thought that it did. So the Cohen's paper is about structure ignitability and how close to uh, structure the flames would have to be for that structure to ignite uh, on average. So the point that we made is that the what matters for us being able to defend the community is not whether that structure ignites, that individual structure ignites, it's whether we'll be able to get people between the homes and the fire to defend the homes in mm -hmm. the first place, to keep them from getting within that hundred feet. So if we can't put firefighters in that space because it's too narrow and it puts them at risk, we're not going to put people there. The, the home will burn because it will, the flames will be within a hundred feet, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's the, the scientific, the focus of the scientific article was not the same as the focus of the fuels treatment. So if we're looking at whether we put people in that gap between the homes and the veg, we looked at flame lengths, we looked at the hauling chart, we looked at where, where would we be comfortable putting people in that gap, and 300 feet gave us that room where we could, we could deploy resources in that fuel break. Again, if it was just the Wui defense zone, it doesn't give us enough room to work, but if we have a strip 300 feet wide, that it was determined by our, our fire and fuel specialist that yes, we'd be able to defend the homes. See, and, was, and that's where I was coming up with like the whole road thing, was that like, so uh, we got to deal with it firsthand on the Whittier fire, is we got stuck up on whiskey and a super narrow road, and they started firing off of it, mid slope road. Nice. We had dozer line up behind us, two blades, and um, the wind's coming up the valley, but we had a huge column where it was wrapping around and it was going to make a huge push into this, this drainage going up through our division and so we started firing it out and we started picking up spots and we knew where the spots were going because the winds you know so we were just like okay we're going to probably pick them up in this area here here we ended up catching two slop overs from the firing and then when it spotted on us we caught a five acre and then in the meantime things were going completely like food bar and between the smoke and trying to see where the spots were popping up and we had dozers that were widening so they started immediately trying to push and they helped us catch it but at the same time we had air tankers coming down their dozer line because they couldn't see anywhere else and we had the, the DC-10 and like you know all those big big boys that were coming in literally a hundred feet off the deck painting while dozers you know, and I had fire, it spotted across the road, ran up on us. So I had fire with my guys, you know, that we were 10 foot off the brush line, taking heat with dozers pushing down and aircraft dumping overhead. And I finally pulled my guys, I'm like, we're going up the hill. And we started catching spot fires on the other side going up the hill. But it was like this huge kind of mess that they were trying to contain and hold and whatever. We ended up holding it, but um, you know when it spotted, I was pulling out all the spots and we fired it off, um, which kind of helped us out. But uh, the aftermath was is that this this big column, which they could see all the way from base camp, ended up pushing up into the drainage that we were firing out, and we were able to hold it up in there. But it was it was dicey for a little while, okay. and you know like by them pushing the dozers and creating that fuel break, but with the positioning on the road, that's why I was kind of inquiring of whether it was mid slope or where that road entailed into that that play, because you don't really get it off of that map. I can no. see, I yeah. see what you're saying now. Well, maybe you can relate your experience to what you might see up there, because that was one of the questions that might come up: is how is the lo the placement of this on the topography going to play? And that was one of the major reasons why they didn't want to put it there. So we'll take a look at that tomorrow. Right? Okay. And those real world examples they matter, right? But that's anecdotal information. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, you, you know, you could you could put it there, but you might want to just push off of the road. Right. I guess you said some more separation. Yeah. yeah. So it's all about separation. Stephen brings up a really good point there, and it's uh, I didn't know if you did it that strategically, but he said it's an anecdotal information. So we have a lot of anecdotal information about firefighting, and we don't have a lot of science to back up our fuels treatments. 
So we had better be able to communicate the anecdotes in a way that people can understand. Because without it, we've got scientific papers uh, demonstrating ineffectiveness of fuels treatments. And we, we acknowledge fuels treatments can be ineffective, certainly if they're not put in the right place, if they're, you know, or, or less than fully effective. I, I don't know how to maybe. My <laughs> point being that we often sometimes, we want to say to the public, trust us, we know how to fight fire. But if we can't explain it, strategy can be matched up against science and we can see who believes what. But if there's no strategy explained, there's nothing to compare against the science. So that's been a major push of ours in these EAs is to get the firefighters to write out why you need this. It's very important the language you use to explain why you need that fuels treatment Picture in the event of a fire. Because we don't have papers to cite uh, that support our fuels treatments for the most part. So when we got, got this particular comment about Cohen, or this is part of an objection about his paper about structured ignitability, we shored up alternative three in terms of why we were doing it that way. Uh, we responded to the comments. Fillmore wrote it. You can read it if you want uh, in terms of why Cohen didn't apply. And we shored up the decision notice to clarify the rationale and show how we considered both science and strategy. And altogether showed that nothing less would meet the purpose and need in terms of flame lengths. So that we can't do less than this amount of treatment. We can't restrict our treatments to within 100 feet of structures and be effective in meeting the purpose and need for the project. Um, they also requested greater specificity of treatments uh, for the Mount Laguna area. They, they would like us to be more specific within the units where we're going to masticate, where we're going to burn, etc. Um, we've told them in response we can't offer you that level of specificity. It would be too limiting. It would be too massive of a document. Um, it was already very specific. Yeah. They, the people, I'm just showing you what they would like to see. They said we shouldn't favor the timber over the chaparral on Mount Laguna because <laughs> um, we're treating, well, there's places where their point was taken, uh, meaning where you've got 30 foot tall trees that look stunted and you've got 20 foot tall shrubs that look happy and healthy. You start wondering, you know, are, we, we are favoring the trees over the chaparral and we have reasons for doing so. It's all this seeing up as haters out there. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> hey, but that would also fall under that. Um, that curve, that 35 years, what we said for Chaparral, right? For what curve? For the burning, when it uh, burns, return, return number. Hey. So if it's outside, if it's not doing healthy, if it's not doing well, then it might need fire introduced into it, depending on how long it's been. Yeah, and remember, Chaparral has like anywhere from 30 to 300 year fire return interval, and even that's debatable. So uh, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into it, but I, I more think. When you think of fuels projects and who's going to be concerned about it, these are the groups that are going to be concerned about it. These are the concerns they brought up to us, so it's more just letting you know this is what they'll bring up again. We, should, we better be prepared to explain it. So I've covered the, the, this was the objection process. This shows you what happens when there's an objection after you've finished the EA. You develop the project, you analyze the project, you had this objection process, you get to a ranger signature in the end. Um, and that's what happened with this project. You guys have been implementing this project on the district. It's, um, I still hear from one of these objectors on a regular basis about this project. <laughs> they don't go away. <laughs> what do you mean, so, like they have on you? No, um, alerted us to some cypresses on Mount Laguna and that are in one of the treatment units and did we know about them? And, uh, we looked into it, yeah, there are some cypresses, and no, we don't plan to treat in that area anytime soon, but th that to say there's people watching fuels treatments, um, and that's why when I, when I talk about, or I talked earlier about when we go beyond the, the trees with our forest health treatments, that's who's watching it, the people who are objecting to our projects. They're the ones who are going to notice something uh, that we do that doesn't appear to be within the bounds of the NEPA. They're smart people. Quick question. So when we open up the scope to the public, um, is there, I guess, a restriction where they have to be local public or, or can anybody come in? No. I've had objections from Idaho about one of our projects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so do you get like a bunch of environmentalist groups opposing? Um, 
Right well, now, I mean, in, in fact, in one of one of our projects, it was a bunch of miners from all across the Western U.S. because they got a really effective newsletter. Yeah. So I just for fuels projects, it's usually local Southern California organizations. Um, yeah. But anyone, anyone's eligible to comment. So I'm going to briefly talk about this. Uh, I'm not going to linger here too long, but it does matter. What happens when you discover new information or change circumstances? We talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but I didn't talk about what you're, you have different avenues. Um, you don't have to do a new EA. I mean, we're doing a new EA because we're bundling a whole bunch of projects, not just refreshing those little ones. But we have a particular process, and it's in the handbook I talked about before, the NEPA uh, handbook. And we're currently using it for two projects on the Cleveland. This year, our NEPA plate is these two projects. Uh, Palomar Mountain Vegetation Treatment, Supplemental EA. So this one, we're treating fuels up on Palomar Mountain. Uh, and the new district ranger would like to add some parcels to that that were not included in the original NEPA. We just acquired a parcel on Palomar Mountain, a really beautiful patch of land that needs some treatment. Um, and so you can't add areas to an EA without uh, supplementing the EA, is what it boils down to. They're, these are new areas, we've never even looked at the, the resources on them. Um, so in order to add those, rather than prepare a new EA, EA, we supplement our existing EA. So we describe what has changed. Well, we have new lands. We have lands we didn't include the first time around. We want to see those included. Um, we also didn't authorize herbicide as part of the CEA initially, and the district ranger would like to use, be able to use herbicide in this area, partially for reforestation of areas that are that used to be conifer and are now overgrown with shrubs. So, in order to crack that EA open to make those changes, we have to do a comment period with the public, and we'll have to do an objection period over a decision. So that's the, if you have to change, if, if enough has changed with your NEPA, then you need to make some changes to the decision, like adding herbicide or adding new areas, you're going to need some new public process around it. Now, a different example from Laguna, we had a design feature that talked about how we were managing spotted owl habitat. And it actually turned out that that design feature wasn't really protecting spotted owl habitat, that we actually needed to do something differently to more effectively protect spotted owl habitat on Mount Laguna. In that case, we're tweaking a design feature. And we were able to prepare a report, an internal report, that said, uh, these, you know, with this change, there won't be any changes to the impacts in terms of their significance. Um, no new decision is needed. It's an adjustment of the decision. It's the line officer's call. Is this enough of a change to the decision to need a new public process, that's for the ranger to decide it. They're the ones on the, on the hook for it, right? Um, adding herbicide would be pretty dicey without doing a new public process. Adding lands would be pretty dicey. Changing a design feature, you can probably do without a public process. Um, in, <laughs> unless, and this, this will point it out, unless you develop that design feature based on a public comment. This, that starts to matter when you start looking at changing things. Did you change something that the public was interested in? Or is this something that we, the agency, were concerned about? That's why we had a standard. Because if you're messing with things that the public suggested to you without involving them and changing them, you're, you're running afoul of the public process, right? Does that make sense? So you basically have to go in and do the 30-day... Um, you do the 30-day comment period, you do the 45-day objection period over again. If you don't get any objections, you don't have to do that follow-on period. Um, you just have to give time for people to object. So it's a, yeah, at least a 75-day process to supplement the EA. Um, yeah, we're, we're working up these proposed actions right now. Our forester is, is doing so. The second one um, also wants to add herbicide, and they have this weird zonation. Uh, where you, in the fuel break, you treat heavily here, medium here, and light here within one fuel break, across the fuel break. So heavy near the homes and lighter away from the homes. <laughs> Some scenic uh, sort of concern that was really kind of strange and, and doesn't make any sense to us anymore, so we want to get rid of that and just treat it as a fuel break. So it's more like a thinning project versus 
I, I think it was somebody's attempt to make it more visually pleasing. <laughs> Not exactly sure how that got included, or, but we're yeah, or less aggressive of a treatment, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah, but we get people asking all the time, "Is this not a fuel break? Is this not where we're trying to stop a fire?" Yeah. So, this is what happens. This is one thing that can happen: is you do some new analysis. These can be really short. This could be a five or ten page document. It doesn't have to be a massive enterprise to change an EPA document. And I think people are often afraid to change an EPA document because it involves going back out to the public. But sometimes it's the best option because it's above board. We're clearly doing what we're supposed to do. We're being transparent, right? I, I, I realized pretty early on here that we have nothing to hide. I have not met anybody here who has nefarious motives that's trying to do something uh, to fool people. But we sometimes feel like you got something to hide because they're worried about projects. Just show them we got nothing to hide. We're, here's why we're doing it. Here's you know we understand your concerns. Here's what we think about them, etc. Okay, I, I pretty much just talked about that. You say that so convincingly, Jeff. Oh, I mean it. <laughs> I mean it because and it was a shift for me because I just felt like I had something to hide, even though I didn't. I mean, once I realized that, I was like, oh, and right, we have nothing you, to hide. When you throw that in. So are you putting it in as like a, an appendix, or like an amendment? It'll be a separate document. Um, it'll live in the project record. I haven't talked about project records, but any NEPA document, you're going to have a, a bunch of files that go with it. Um, so it would just join the, those files. It will, that'll require a new decision, uh, because it, you know, it'll need a new ranger signature, too. Mm -hmm. OK, this one I'm going to. I'm gonna, present uh, fairly quickly. Um, this is something that Fillmore and I have been talking about for years. So, you know, we, we were doing all of our fuels treatments under CADEXs. Um, now we've glommed our CADEXs together and we're doing EAs, and we've got several EAs per district. The, the catch with an EA is that the agency has to prove that we're not going to have significant impacts. Remember, it's a finding of no significant impact. So the burden is on us to say we're not going to have significant impacts with our activity. So we're saying it here, 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 and here. And we're not going to have significant impacts. Instead of what if we just acknowledge that we could have significant impacts and cover it all with one EIS, right? Then we don't have to worry about having different design features on the Descansa, then we have on the Tribuco, and get, you know, what EA are we working under? And, uh, it, does it need to be refreshed? You know, if we're working with one document, it would be consistent. It would be defensible. Um, so it would be a different approach than what we're currently taking. The pros, we wouldn't have to deal with that significance problem. We wouldn't have to constantly explain why we're not having significant impacts. It would be, we, we could say impacts could be significant. We, and we could own that instead of constantly having to show that they're not going to be significant. I'm not saying that they are significant, <laughs> but, but we could say that they were. That's for the line officer to decide. We can make use of the new analytical tools that we've been working on for several years, uh, the fuel break analysis where we ranked our fuel breaks, this community defense analysis that's currently underway. We've got a lot of new information and we could actualize all that information with a new plan, new EIS. And they could have that big picture perspective. You know, what's really important throughout the Cleveland as opposed to district by district. Economy of scale, uh, you know, one, one document as opposed to ten. The cons, it would be expensive. It would be lengthy. It would be complex. And it could get tied up in mitigation. Um, and the, I think the current uh, a current con that's not listed up here is that the forest supervisor is not supportive. <laughs> did he say that? He did at one point. He's tired of EISs for right now. <laughs> but that could change. Yeah. I think pros would be transparency too. Transparency, yeah. So we've had discussions about this. We're not pursuing it. But it gives you an idea of the thought process of why an EIS could be advantageous to doing these EAs all over the place. So I know other people are thinking about it. Uh, it's just more, 
I, I've talked about the cat x side of the equation. We've talked a lot about the EAs, and this is the, the higher level. Uh, it's easier to defend an EIS than it is to defend an EA in court. Also, so let's go there, court. Also, the programmatic approach is used, though, like we were just talking about this this morning. All right, do you have an EA for every little project that you guys are going to do out there on the base? We have our, we have an EA for each planning unit. Do you? Yeah. Well, I thought you said it was for the whole base. The the we have a NEPA for the whole base. Okay. But then there's the programmatic EA NEPA for each. Yeah. Yeah, for each planning unit. It's weird. You have an e EA yeah. on top of the EIS. Well, I, I, you can tier to another document. So, like for example, there could be like a nationwide EIS covering feral pig removal and then you tier to it with your own local EA where you cite that EIS and you say and, and we're not going to have any impacts here based on the analysis you can see. I don't, I don't think we have any EIS because in our, in our uh, plan it just talks about the EAs for each planning unit. When DOD manages NEPA differently than Forest Service in this whole book I showed you that's all Forest Service regs. And we've we've had a lot of litigation over the years, which has driven the development of our regulations. So you likely haven't faced all the litigation that we have, which changes the regulations. So let me talk about that. Um, the So the objection process is the last chance for the commenters to get recourse from the agency directly. They're, they're, they're complaining to the higher level official, you know, I don't like what this ranger is about to do, can't you please change it? The higher level official says, sorry, you're out of luck. Or, you know, okay, we'll modify it in this way, um, but we move forward with the project. If those people are still unhappy and they have enough funds, they sue us. That's the next step in the process, as it were. Right? So they still don't like what we're doing, they didn't get a satisfactory outcome through the NEPA process, then they sue us and they take it to the courts. So I'll remind you, it's a procedural statute. It's, it's not substantive. It, if you follow the process, you'll be okay. If it isn't written down and included, it didn't happen. No one sits in a jury or on, on the witness stand and talks about the project. It's a paperwork exercise. There is a judge involved who will be reading the papers. If there's nothing written down, the judge doesn't see it. So that's why everything, you know, if you can have the best story in the whole world, but if it's not in the project record, who cares? The hard look doctrine. Um, this is court decisions in the past have determined that under NEPA, you have to take a hard look at the environmental effects of your actions. The federal agencies have to take a hard look. So it means just what it says. Did you really look at it? Or did you sort of like, eh, there won't be any impacts, you know. Did you really look at it? Did you really consider what the public said? Did you take a hard look? If you explain clearly and show your work, you'll be okay. Responses to comments. I talked about this before and I said it was important. It's really important because it shows that you thought about what the public had to say. You considered their comments. Even if you didn't change your documents, you had a reasonable explanation. Agency deference. Judges aren't scientists or land managers, uh, and they're supposed to defer to agency expertise. So if we've got firefighters that have a story, the judge is supposed to trust that story as long as it's explained clearly. And it can include strategy, not just science. So whenever I write these documents, whenever I think about who's the ultimate arbiter of these documents, of what the words mean, if the words are enough, it's the judge. The judge isn't a scientist, the judge isn't a land manager, it's not a crazy member of the public either usually. It's somebody who's reasonable and has seen a lot of language and is going to be looking at your language to see if it makes sense. There used to be a lot of concern about preliminary injunctions where they'd stop a project from happening until the court case got resolved. That's not usually a case for us for fuels work. Um, it was more of a problem for timber work where they couldn't cut trees and they like contracts, etc., to do so. Okay, well this is a preliminary conclusion. I'm gonna, I've got a little bit more material um, after this slide, but NEPA is one of the most important conservation laws on the books. I, I believe this. NEPA uh, has become a way that we are careful about our decisions with federal projects. 
it can be complicated, frustrating, expensive, and conflict-ridden. It's got a bad reputation for all these reasons, right? It's, it's a challenging process. It's not an easy process. It generally slows projects down and requires careful consideration before a decision is reached. That might be one of the best advantages of it. I mean, we, we like to think we want a quick decision on a project, but quick decisions aren't always good decisions. You know, well thought out decisions, decisions where everybody's input was incorporated, often you learn things through that process. And so it sometimes results in innovative solutions to troublesome problems. I've seen cases where the public has given us really good ideas that we didn't think of ourselves, and we've included them into the proposed actions. And it's become part of our democratic process. It's the only way, usually, that the public is able to affect how public lands are managed. And now, new this year, the elusive, mysterious bottom of the triangle. I wanted to do something a little bit differently than in the past. Um, and since we never, I never have lingered on the bottom of the triangle, I'm just going to show you the bottom of the triangle so that you see that there is a bottom to the triangle. And I, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Like, are we meeting our goal? Has the Cleveland made progress in reducing the number of acres that are adjacent to development within the WUI um, that are classified as high risk? Are wildfires becoming larger, more frequent, or more severe? Is there a seasonal shift in fire activity? The, the one is in yellow because that's a new question that we added to try to address climate change, which our new planning regulations require us to look at cha climate change and how it would affect the forests. So we thought looking at wildfire trends would help us look at climate change. Is that the new planning rule? It's responding to the new planning rule as of 2012. We had to develop questions to address climate change. We chose to develop that question in particular. So uh, this was for fiscal year 16. We treated 535 acres of buoy defense zone on the Cleveland. Um, we had tallied 10,000 acres at revision back in 2005, and we've reduced that number to 6,339 acres since 2005. That's a pretty substantial reduction of acres of high-risk buoy. I see Stephen has a furrowed brow as he considers this. I was trying to use that. Uh acre like has been reduced to acres that are left untreated or unprotected in presumably yeah okay. yeah um this past year fiscal year 16 we treated uh, 3500 acres altogether and you can see most of it was in the threat zone a quarter of it was in the wui defense and nine percent was in out in neither wui threat nor defense and that's the fuel breaks and surprisingly to me, we couldn't find any trend of increasing fire activity on the Cleveland responsive to climate change. Number of fires, more frequency, severity, seasonality, no trends. Not yet. Not that we've seen. And we looked at a lot of data to make that one statement. <laughs> so. Has the forest been successful in reducing mortality risk, the tree mortality? Um, is it increasing across the landscape and is it distributed evenly across elevations? This is the idea that low elevation forests are going to start to die off uh, because of climate change and so forests will be moving up the slope and chaparral will be following it, kind of what I was talking about before with Malaguna. We're still, as I mentioned, recovering from the 2003 and 2007 fires. Um, we, the Cleveland still has over half of the forest is experiencing too frequent fire. A third of the forest is within the natural range of variation, and 11% mountaintops have too infrequent fire. We did treat a heck of a lot of montane conifer in fiscal year 16, more than past years. And I started reporting on this a few years ago. We suppressed 79 fires during fiscal year 16, and only six were greater than an acre. And so to me, this is the best measure of how we're dealing with that too frequent fire is we're putting out a lot of fires. So fire suppression is good where you have too frequent fire, right? And we had a history of suppressing too many fires, but that's not the case in Chaparral and Coastal Sage Scrub. We should be putting them out where we can. Um, I won't talk about the white question, but the orange or the yellow ones we did develop um, that have a, a tie to fuels. Are, are, are shrublands converting to annual grasses? Are oaks dying more across the landscape? So we calculated that about 10% of our shrublands have turned into grasslands. Uh, so 
This is looking at over a 30 year period. About 10% of our shrublands are now grasslands. That's a pretty big chunk of land. But is that also pertaining to one of the, the large fires that you had had? No, there's a, there's a window. We're actually going to bump. The window is three years after fire. We wouldn't consider lands three years after any fire. We're going to bump that up to five years after any fire, then we won't look at that. And then also, does that fall under, because um, I know you guys are dealing with GSOB, right? So is GSOB playing a, a large part in that? Those wouldn't be considered shrub lands. Those would be oak woodlands. But I'll talk about GSOB right here, because coast live oak mortality has increased dramatically. So this, these numbers were shocking to me this year. So we'd had about 1,000 acres of oaks dying a year up until 2014, then 2,000 acres in 15, and then 4,000 acres in 16. We got an oak problem, <laughs> a bad oak problem, and it'll contribute to our fuels problem, obviously. Um, so what we do about it, it's going to be tough to figure out exactly what we do about it. Um, you know, trying to keep that GSOB, Gold Spotted Oak Borer, from spreading to other forests is one of our main emphases. For the Cleveland, it's too late. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, because that's one of the issues that we've been dealing with um, over in like Waller and all that. They had us looking for that. We yeah. There. No, I, yeah. And other forests, you should absolutely be looking for it and trying to control it before it gets out of control like it was for us. Just showed up on the Tribuco district this year, and so uh, now all three districts have it. It's moving up on the Palomar Mountain. So major changes to our ecosystems, right, with, with oaks dying in a whole new past. Um, we don't know much about how well the oaks will regenerate, so that's the missing picture of this puzzle. Um, but we certainly know they're dying. So we answer, these are the kinds of questions we look at those goals and are we meeting the goals that we set out? If we're not, we should probably change the way we're doing business. But then we do also look at some projects. So if you ever hear about LMP monitoring, land management plan monitoring, that this is what it looks like for a project. This is up on Laguna. We went out and looked at a particular unit off uh, Morris Ranch Road. <clears throat> the purpose was both of those two goals, forest health and community protection. They burned 250 acres in the unit. They had better consumption than usual thanks to the drought. Fire effects monitoring was completed for it. There was a FEMO on the burn, and uh, they, they had a report for us to review. Best management practices were implemented and effective for uh, managing the soil, putting the water bars in where needed on fire line, etc. And it was overall found to be beneficial for resources in the public. Um, so this could be a painless process for a project like this because everything was done right. It can be a very painful project for <laughs> the pro projects that didn't, that, you know, somewhere along the way between the plan, the NEPA, the burn plan, the contract, the implementation. If something gets broken along the way, this is where we find it out. It's an obvious place to find it out because we, we chase the documents back through the chain to see if everything lines up. We did what we said we'd do in the plan, we did what we said we'd do in the NEPA, we did what we said we'd do in the burn plan, and it actually happened on the ground. This is a win-win. It's good for everybody. Our public affairs officer wants to use this for you know, promoting fire you know, so that people understand, this is what a forest looks like a year after a burn. Looks good, right? Okay, almost done. Any questions about that, what I just presented? The, that's the bottom of the triangle that you just saw. When we go back and we check, are, are we meeting our goals? Are we, are we doing our projects, following the plan? If I can just say, um, when we were up at Laguna, I talked about the bottom of the triangle, but I talked about it primarily from a project level monitoring. You guys might recall, and uh, I think it's good because Jeff was talking about, and I touched on it, but I didn't really get into it, but it's higher level, you know, land management plan monitoring. So there's different scales to it. And we're required to do that monitoring. It's part of the NIFMA requirements that we have, the regulations, um, is that we have to monitor our plan, make sure it's still working through the life of the plan. Question. Um, yeah. With the FEMO report, does that stay? I guess, where does it go? Does it stay with the burn boss? Does it become a public document? It doesn't become public as far as I've seen. Um, it stays in the, with the burn boss, I would think. I, should, I mean, technically, it should probably go to the burn file. Uh, we, on the Cleveland, have a pad, and when we had the O-Drive, a consolidated uh, repository on the O-Drive for it, which is a good idea, so that people can access it later when 
Jeff comes to me and says, hey, you have a female report for the burn you did in such and such unit, I can say, I'm going to go to the file. Because if it, it's dispersed and all the burn projects are just hard to access that. Remember how we talked about with data, data is only usable if it's accessible? Um, so you know it's not accessible? <laughs> <laughs> we all feel that pain, but the uh, I when we do these, you know, so I randomly select projects across the Cleveland to do this monitoring, and I'll go to the uh, fuels battalion and I'll say, gather your documents for this project, and I rely on them to do that. So they should be pulling whatever's in their file and bringing it out in the field, and then we review it there. So you probably at that moment want to know where your <laughs> information is, right? If, they, if, if Tasha does it the same way. Recommendations for you. I've talked about this throughout, but these are kind of the, what I want to leave you with. Get the ID team to the project site early on the left side. Don't come up with your plan without talking to some resource folks about what you're, you're trying to do. Get out there and see the ground with them. Get to know what their concerns are so that you can work with those early on they end up protecting you. It doesn't, it might not look like it, like I, when you're talking about they won't let us do this part, of the, this part of the fuel break. They're not against you. They're trying to protect you in the face of litigation, really, and, and violations of the law where we get hung out to dry. I mean, it's, it's not, I didn't talk about how unpleasant litigation is as a workload. It's awful. When the project gets litigated, it's bad news. It slows everything down, it gums up the works, it consumes us, and we don't even get the right outcomes because our attorneys have a settle. So even if we're in the right, they end up settling and we don't get to do what we were trying to do. It's just that you don't want to go there. <laughs> it's the, the short version of that. Be familiar with the LMP, with regulations and policy that affect your work. I mean, that's just kind of a um, good idea. And when it's time to write the burn plan or contract specs, get out the NEPA document and use its language. Or be very careful about how you modify its language. If the language doesn't make sense from the NEPA to the burn plan, check with the person whose design feature it was as you change the language to something that makes sense. Right? Don't take it upon yourself to reinterpret all of the design features in your own way without checking with other folks. That's just something I've seen. It's, it's better if the language carries through in some cases it can't. If the language really doesn't make any sense in the burning plan, change it to something that does make sense, but don't lose the intent of it. So hopefully, I have explained the purpose and use of the LMP. I, any questions about the LMP and how it gets used? I'm going to take silence as, as meeting the objectives. <laughs> Nailed it. Explaining how to correspond the LMP direction with project planning. You got the handouts with the plan, you got your project, you want it to carry through. The differences among NEPA and decision documents, probably more than you ever wanted to know about that law and its complexity. I actually got a question about that, sorry. Oh, right! <laughs> you mentioned it earlier, um, programmatic NEPA. Now, if, if you start categorizing more things, would that be less expensive as opposed to doing individual ones? Well, it is. Um, are you thinking at the EA level or at the EIS level? So we're doing one right now with um, an admin uh, programmatic need, but it's going to include like all the uh, repeaters, um, all the forest service stations, campgrounds. Yeah, I'm bundling up as much as you can in that case. The only time bundling can be a problem is if you're looking at something where it would change your level of analysis. You know, it's going to drive it to being significant impacts. Um, yeah, it can make the only the only other problem with bundling. It can make it really complicated, you know, um, and and time consuming. But it's so much easier to do it once instead of five times for all those little projects. Now, do you risk at some point adding too much, where like you're, you're saying it's going to get a lot more complex? Or it would get kicked back. That so you can check with like the resource specialist, it, it, whoever's got the most concern about the sites that you're looking at, and see does it make sense for us to do this? Because they're going to want to do whatever saves them work too, right? They're going to they they don't want to do extra work. So if it makes sense to them to bundle them and do it that way, 
then it probably makes sense to you too. It'll save everybody time. And I've seen some specialists that are kind of for it, and then other specialists are kind of like, I don't know if it's like a, a flagging issue where they got to go and uh, do an analysis on, because it's across the whole district. Yeah. And, and I think their concern is like, obviously the workload. Yeah. Uh, well, and so in many ways, it's, I think of that being kind of a leadership decision of like, which way are you going? Are you going to bundle them and dedicate that staff time to it, or are you going to keep them small and whittle away over it over the years? Okay. Be the ID, you. Be the ID. Be the ID team leader. <laughs> And hopefully I'll explain what the resource specialties bring to the table on an ID team, speaking of. Um, they, you know, without them, it would be hard to do the analysis that we're supposed to do under the law. Explaining the NEPA regulations and the associated public process. I talked a lot about that. And the objection process, litigation, and project implementation timing. Anything you want to ask me at this point? That's from the end of my presentation. On an unplanned event, does it does NEPA still come into play? What kind of unplanned event? A wildfire in the area near some fuel breaks. So NEPA does not apply to fire suppression. Um, fire suppression is an emergency action. Um, for bear, the uh, burned area emergency response, people look at the bear assessment as sort of a NEPA light. Um, that it's sort of like a mini. ID team process, uh, you know, it's a week long, you do your assessment of what treatments are needed and you implement. You don't have to do separate NEPA for them. Um, oftentimes you'll do a closure order, that might require, a, a, I mean closure orders require light NEPA, um, but as you know, public health and safety protection, we've got a category for that. I didn't, there's some other categories, there's a lot of categories. I just showed you the fuels ones, but there's a whole bunch of categories we can use. And, Protection of public health and safety is one that we commonly use. Um, would that fall under um, uh, wildfire use? How would that play? Because if we're kind of letting the fire do its thing and monitoring it, it's and still fire. Yeah, it's still, still fire. I don't think it would it's well, but there is some neat interaction there. If I can, uh, in please. Terms of, what's that? Well, in, especially for a fire that's being managed for resource benefits. The reason you manage it for resource benefits is you want to be able to capture those. I mean, not only because you want it to happen on the land, but you also want to be able to capture that um, from a reporting standpoint. So when you're going to do that, you can only, um, A, it has to be under previous NEPA. So the area that you're going to count acres towards later has to have been um, completed under a NEPA decision. And then on top of that, the, the results of the fire have to match the desired conditions in the NEPA. In other words, it has to have met the desired end state of the NEPA document after the fire. Um, so if you have a fire that's being managed for resource benefits and it just completely destroys the stand, which isn't what you wanted in the NEPA document, you can't count that uh, as completed treatment acres. Oh, okay. Nor yeah, so you can just you, don't count the acres. So you just go, don't count the acres as completed. Uh, which is too bad because those same acres would have otherwise been able to be treated and had been analyzed in a NEPA decision, so it's kind of wasted in a way. Um, and again, you can't count them unless it's been analyzed under a NEPA document already. Now, a similar um, process to NEPA that does apply for wildfires is use of heavy equipment in wilderness. So for that, you need a regional forester approval. Um, so they, we've got a set of uh, approved actions without any input from line, and then we've got certain actions that require input from line. It's not NEPA, but it's it's similar to it because it involves approvals for activities. What is NEPA though? Because that had been predetermined in our land management plan, and it's in our. Well, it has NEPA background behind it, but it's not uh, it's not officially a NEPA exercise. It's a decision-making process, yeah. similar to NEPA. So but it's, it's got to be a lot faster than NEPA. It's kind of like when uh, like you mechanized equipment in the wilderness. That's yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's wilderness, wilderness Act compliance is what it really Yeah, because we have, I know we have, our district rangers kind of said that, you know, 
if, if you use it, that's fine, but just have a good reason, you know, for me of why you used it. Um, you know, take the actions that you did. So. Uh, our limit, so our limit plan has language, I thought, concerning pre-identified actions. I know our fire manager reference system, which is our fire manager plan, has it. So chainsaws are automatically allowed, whatever. But isn't that technically NEPA since that's in the land management plan? No. No? No. I thought the land management plan was an EIS. Well, the land management plan is backed up by an EIS, but it, it itself is not a NEPA document. Right, right, right. I don't know if that rain, ranger can just say it's okay. Because well, that's I, not... I mean, it's like for, like for using, you know, if we need to use saws or if the helicopter's coming in and having to do a drop or two or something like that, but, you know, or if they're going to land the helicopter in an area that doesn't approve. So that all requires compliance with the Luminous Act, right? Yeah, well, and, and it, it's, you so see, you, the ranger can, can say what they want to. They may they may suffer consequences later, right? I mean, that's that's how line officers <laughs> work. I mean, it's a risk assessment. And if, if he's taking that risk, he or she, then that's their risk to take. You're right, I'm being very black and white. It's <laughs> the desire is to be compliant with the law. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't advise that. <laughs> compliance, but it's not my responsibility to make that decision. Yeah, but it's your responsibility to advise people when you know they're breaking the law. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you tell your range that, John? <laughs> don't tell us. <laughs> go right out there and tell them. Any other questions? Covered a lot of material today. Thanks for staying awake, listening, giving some feedback. I appreciate the, your contributions. I don't, don't want to be a talking head for this long. No other questions for him? All right, give him a round of applause. I want to thank Jeff because I always enjoy it. Every time I listen to your lecture, this is what the, because you taught this the first year, right? I did. Yeah, so this is what, at least your fourth time doing it this, and then you've done it elsewhere too. Always a good job. Hopefully it's better every time. It is awesome. That was the Rosa Cruz So thank you for coming in and teaching today, Jeff. So let's see, just yeah, the last couple good. last minute admin yeah. things. Uh, I don't think so. What time tomorrow we meet at uh, Elsinore? I don't think I said one o'clock. One o'clock. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go for the shoot for nine thirty, but realistically nine forty five. Um, you know what I'm saying? You know, a little bit of time. The so shoot for nine thirty. Hey, I'm trying to be pragmatist. I could say nine. Yeah, that little four cylinder, I struggle with the hell. <laughs> the field days, they don't need to be quite as long. So I'm shooting for like, you know, boots on ground, starting to talk by 10 to 2 to 2.30, just depending on where we're at. You know, a good three, four hours, and we'll stop and have lunch. Obviously, there's not going to be a place for lunch, so you have a pack of lunch. Is this, I think this is actually our first field shoot that we've done, which is we should have had one at Palomar already. So this will be good. Uh, I got confirmation. I think Jeff said he might make a little bit of it. Andrew might make a little bit of it, but uh, Jacob and Cole should be there. We want to go look at the fuel break. We want to talk about this Medgate project. Uh, if we have time, I might want to go into Rancho uh, Capistrano too, because they've got some interesting fuel projects that are around that in the wilderness. And it's just it's real free form. It kind of depends on where the conversation goes. And just the whole point of it is just to kind of talk about in the field all the stuff we've talked about so far. Um, so it's going to be as cool as you guys make it in terms of questions and discussions and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? And then, uh, like I said, Thursday, 0900, Hughes Valley for more lectures. So, and I think, I think that was the only bit of admin thing. Oh, I did want to announce, I don't know if you guys saw this, but SpaceX successfully launched their Falcon Heavy, which is freaking awesome if you guys are SpaceX fans. They're throwing their Tesla out in the space? Yeah, yeah. It successfully launched that uh, Mars orbital uh, loop or whatever it was, and, and they relanded the boosters. I don't know, I'm a huge SpaceX fan, so I'm really excited and it can explode on the uh, launch pad like I thought maybe it was going to. Nah, that's just me. Um, is there anything else, guys? No, I need to talk to you. Anything else from an admin? Tomorrow. What time again? 9.30. 9.30. <laughs> Ish. And what else? So 9.30? You guys? Um, 
I don't think it's supposed to be somebody else. I can be your mom. I'll take care of that. All right, cool. Well, we'll talk later then. Yeah, the thing, uh, the thing with that Tesla too. Say again? The thing with the Tesla too. Yeah. Is they threw a, um, a space suit yeah. into the front seat. Talk about that. Yeah. Apparently they put space oddity on the radio too. <laughs> They're just going to throw it out into space. It's going to be on a billion year Mars solar loop. I don't know. Yeah. You guys be using trash. Alpine? <laughs> a Tesla is not space trash. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it could land on the planet and actually drive. Yeah, well, I think we used to scan those one time too. Just yeah. kind of like whatever until it was available. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, hey, so I want to say. Okay, copies of that in the back of you. Of oh, that? Yeah. You keep that. You're talking about the brown book? Yeah. No, I had everything. No, that's not this book. Oh, yeah, I want that. I want that tomorrow. And then do you have elevation?